to the end, you podcast. That's right. Going to podcast to the end, baby. Going to podcast all the way to the end. <laughs> the end of 2021. True. We're done with John Carpenter. We got to uh, we got to pay pay some bills here. Right, some outstanding bills on previous filmmakers we've covered. Sure, there's ledgers we have to write. Right, you know, tax time, balance. baby. Yeah. Last three weeks of 2021, new releases. Oh! Been a little while since we've had a new release from a previous director, and it just so happened that three of them lined up in a row. Been a little while. To take us out of this cursed, cursed year. This is the first one. This is, of course, a uh, blank check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. Very fast. That's the in-person speed you get. Fucking Zoom, man. No Zoom delay. You know what I don't like? Zoom. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the film, though, with Tim Allen. Right. What's that called? Zoom Academy for Superheroes or some shit like that? I mean, I just know it as Zoom, but Fucking yes. Poor also man, known Sky as, High. Yeah. Yeah, Courtney Cox. Jevy. Kate Mara. Spencer Breslin. Uh, yes. Who else is in that? Rip Did we Torn? go through the whole list? Rip Torn is in it? Oh, yeah. Maybe it's good. Rip. Alexis Bledel uncredited. Wilmer is, Valderrama, Devin uh, Akoi, a- Aoki. 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 That's how you, is yeah. this a real movie or is this a it's Disney a real Channel movie. original? It's like, it's no, it was real. It was, it's not Disney, right? Because uh, no, this was theatrical. Sky was, High was Disney. This was Columbia. This was, but Sky um, High was theatrical as well. Isn't it? It I wasn't know. Disney Channel. This was Columbia. I think it's based on a book or some shit. Uh, no, it was based on this app um, that you could video conference with, but they took it in a weird way. David. Direction. Yeah, no, it was based on a children's book. Yeah. It's Tim Allen teaches a school of superheroes and it looked like dog shit. It's from the director Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey and The Borrowers, which are good movies. Peter Hewitt. Yeah. He also did Thunderpants. Did he do Garfield the movie? He did do Garfield the movie. See, this is the thing. Because I think uh, Bogus Journey is a very stylish film. Bogus Journey is one of those movies where as a debut film, you're like, is this guy going to be like a a fucking Burtony kind of? And then he kind of just shit the bed. That's number two. Yeah. They brought on a new director for number two? Because they, they wrote the script and they were like, it's so visual what they've written here. We need someone who is primarily a visual stylist. And I think he was like a film school guy where he had a student film where they were like, this guy's insane. Because Bogus Dream has all the fucking hell shit, the nightmares. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, Those yeah, sequences yeah, yeah. are like yeah. really, really, really cool. good. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. this is like some young Wonderkin director. And then he just makes uh, garbage. Cool. It's Yeah. And it's not, it's not fucking... Stephen Herrick territory. Stephen Herrick right. had to go make the Mighty Ducks and Mr. Holland's Opus right. and all that. He becomes weirdly Mr. Disney. Totally. Straight uh, down the 101 middle. Dalmatians he did. Right, right. He did the um the Brat Pack Three Musketeers, which I saw in theaters. Right. These are all Disney movies. Yep. What's the last thing Stephen Herrick made? Uh like he had a movie this year on Netflix called Afterlife of the Party, starring Victoria, former uh Griffin Newman co star okay. Victoria Justice. Hey. Okay. Right? Didn't you do a movie with her? I did. Of course. You're talking about Naomi and Eli's No Kiss List. That's right. You were on the No Kiss List. Uh, Bruce Wong. uh, He also did a movie called The Great Gilly Hopkins. Oh, sure. Based on a classic children's book. That's an Ellen Burstyn. Try that one. Thank you. Uh, No, I'm not seeing Ellen Burstyn here. Kathy Bates. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. And then Sophie Nizale. I don't know. I moved on because he also did a children's film called The Chaperone starring Triple H. Yes. Yes. He's yes. in front of a school bus going. David's crossing his arms, looking sternly That's at me. That's a Herrick? Stephen Herrick. Wow. Starring Paul Lawrence, aka Triple H. Yeah. Paul Lawrence. That's yeah, his, his real name? name is Paul Lawrence, which is funny because his like stage name is like Hunter Helms Hensley right. Hurst Hemsley right. or his whatever. Right, his character is supposed to be like a rich guy. He's supposed guy. to be a fancy man, right. Yeah. A fancy man who's like, you know, 380 pounds. Or it is funny though that it's like, here's his real name. Then we're going to give him a fake he real was, name and was, then a nickname based off the fake real name. He was initially called Jean Paul Levesque and he was mm-hmm. presented as right. like a French Canadian aristocrat. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Which right. is so funny. Fucking and they were like, let's tone it down a little. He's just a rich guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I learned about all of this in the recent Vice documentary about China. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the wrestler, sure. Yeah. Highly recommend. Cool. He's yeah, very he's tragic check that out. Very he's tragic. Now sort of become. I mean, he's the he's the he's Vince new McMahon genuinely era. on the, the new business. Vince McMahon. Right, like he married her. He married as Stephanie. A, yeah, yeah, but it was sort of like both a scripted thing and a real right. thing. I can't right. remember which also, came first. He's like he is within kayfabe. He's both the guy who's being groomed to run the whole thing, and within kayfabe, the guy who's being groomed to be the new head heel, like 
in universe the, the McMahon new McMahon, right right the he's new the suit. commissioner right. yeah it's yeah. fucking i mean yeah. i haven't really paid attention to wrestling since i was a teenager but when i was a teenager he was he was a big deal as a wrestler i just like watching documentaries about wrestling there are so many there's Dude. so many if and you they're sign all up for really wwe good. like yes. you know dot com or whatever also you can watch like any documentary they've ever made and there's apparently yeah. like hundreds of them Hmm. Uh, did you know, come on? Surely you liked wrestling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe you didn't as much as you should have for yeah. you know, considering no, you were a little man. Listen, I did. I definitely sent one of my friends to the hospital because we uh, were wrestling oh, there in we his go. living okay. room. Right. There, okay. we go. there we go. Yeah. Okay. You know, like Ultimate yeah. Warrior. You know. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 I feel Hulk. like you'd be a, a Jake the Snake guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Did yeah. you like mankind? But I like the fucking guys with the fucking two by four. Sure. Oh, okay. like uh, a junkyard dog or what? whatever his name was? Well, that sounds good. So, I don't know that, about that. That, a, <laughs> that sounds good. Wasn't like that, that like another league, like extreme ECW? There was ECW. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. That was rival. the one that was really hardcore there where they'd hit each other. Yeah. But, you know, they would always sort of eventually get sucked into Bam Bam the... Bigelow. That feels like a Ben guy. Did you like Mankind? Come on. Yeah, Mankind was cool. Yeah, he did bits. He's crazy. Yeah, he, he did sock bits. puppets. He yeah. was weird. And he was like fucked up. Yeah, he know? was crazy. You were like, is this guy really I, crazy? I or? had friends who were really into that stuff and they would like throw each other on the tables and get yeah. really hurt. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get into that. But I remember Mankind, someone exposed me to like the scene. Um, Where he's thrown off the cage, the top of the cage. No, what are you talking about? It's like That's a, we've got as my witness. He's broken in half. I want to say it's Japan, okay, where it's like really crazy, and he like is like it's like a barbed wire match yeah, or yeah, something yeah, yeah, yeah. really yeah. sick. Yeah, he would do stuff like that. Yeah, that's fucked up. Uh, anyway, our podcast today is about a director who hasn't made any movies about wrestling, but kind of fits within that world. It made some movies about uh, naked wrestling, bed sure. wrestling, as I like bed to call wrestling, it. Wait, bed wrestling, as I like to call wrestling. it. Oh, yeah, right. Once in high school, um, uh, one of the classes, one of the homeroom classes, put all their desks in a square, like, to make a border. And then they did a Royal Rumble where you had to knock someone out of the square to win. Did it get intense? Yeah, I think it got too intense, yeah. And they, they got in trouble. Yeah. But I remember, like, people were like, they're doing a Royal Rumble at, like, 4-H. And we were like, really? And we walked in there and I was like, they are! Like, wow. this, is, this is going down. Anyway. If anyone at CLS remembers the Royal Rumble, I think it was 4-H. You know, get in touch. Tweet at us. Yeah, any American students want to get in touch with us. <laughs> All right. This is a podcast about filmographies. All Directors right, sorry. with massive success early on in their careers. They're given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce baby out. See, I thought you guys wouldn't have been fighting. Instead, you would have just been like challenging each other with facts about royalty. Uh -huh, right. We have like a who's a, the queen? A, a quiz off. Uh, who's the Duke of something? He doesn't know. <laughs> who's, the, who's the Earl of Sandwich? <laughs> I can look it up. Delta Terminal Two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fuck! That is what comes up these days when you Google Earl of Sandwich. They're, they're top. Thank they're you. Top. Thank you. Present holder, John. Here he is. This is the fucking current Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he looks like he, 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 looks like he's been, he was born ready for that role. <laughs> John Montague. Some mayo on that guy's slipping between Earl two slices of, of bread. Sandwich. Wow. Wow. Um, some years ago, we covered the American Hollywood film career. Of when was that? Paul Verhoeven, I believe that was 2017? No, it's 2018. Yeah, it's early 2018, like January 2018. Okay, I knew it was the beginning of a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we covered, we covered his Hollywood films. Um, and then we were like, fuck, we should cover L2. We never covered Black Book. No, we keep meaning to, but it's like, yeah. who has the time? We never covered his early films. But it is this weird career because uh, this provocative, transgressive uh, Dutch filmmaker... Who then makes this unlikely leap over to Hollywood, right? With like right. Flesh of Blood is his bridge film. And then Robocop is like, oh, this guy's become one of the preeminent sci fi action blockbuster filmmakers of his generation. Throws two erotic drama thrillers in there just for good measure. Uh, taps out on Hollow Man, which is kind of all three at the same mm -hmm. time. And then is like, I hate Hollywood. I'm leaving. Doesn't make a movie for 10 years. Uh, maybe eight. I forget when Black Book is. I mean, I feel like it's like 10 years between Hollow Man and Black Book, 10 years between 
No, it's only six. Black Book is 06. Wow. Okay. And then he, you know, he did do that other movie. Um, yeah, that no one talks about. That no about. one talks about. That was like, wasn't that Tricked? Like, is that it? Yeah. I believe that was like a class he was teaching and it was a collaborative process with a bunch of student filmmakers. Well, I'll just tell you it exists. That's all. It exists. Yep. It exists. Um, but yeah. And then, right. So L, L is, is 2016. Okay. So 10 years after that. So that's almost a longer break yeah, between Black Surprisingly. And yeah. And then, you know, Benedetta, I feel like that was announced like two years ago. It's been in the works for a while. He's yes. been circling this one. He had a hip injury when it was like about to go, which is one of those things where you're just like, Paul, oh, you're in your 80s. We got to get this done. We got to get this made. Kept on getting announced at Con with like increasingly provocative sales posters. Right. And you were right. like, please God, let this happen. Don't fucking let this fall I apart. I mean, the, the elevator pitch is just Paul Verhoeven non-sploitation. And right. people were so excited. They were. Uh, they were this. kind of baying for, you know, right. er erotica, essentially. Yeah. Uh, right. I tried to go into this as largely blind as I could and have avoided the trailers. I mean, because this is one of those movies where I was just like, look, it's not fucking no way home. I'm not going to get inundated with marketing. Right. I can like stay pretty clean of this. And I know I want to see this. And pretty much what I knew about this movie was, OK, in my head, I've saved this for the last couple of years as. Paul Verhoeven, lesbian nun movie, right? And then when it starts screening, everyone's like, huh, that's kind of reductive. That's not really what it is. If you're expecting that salacious, that's not really what you should be thinking. So like, that's all I had in my mind was like, I thought the movie was this. Everyone's telling me that's kind of not a great summation of what it is. Right. right. And then you watch it and you're like, this is a movie about a lesbian nun. But, but it also is about... It's a lot more complicated. It's yeah. about it's about the rules. It's about power. That's one thing I'll say it's about power. Yes. Yeah. It's a fascinating movie because it's kind of going like it, it's about religion kind of buying its own bullshit, but also not maybe you know like that weird sort of like blurred line. Look, he's got a fire in his belly right now. He's announcing new movies left and right. It Is feels it? like he's, he's trying doing to something some with uh, 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 New Meyer, Meyer right mm -hmm. from Robocop, yes. right? Right, and he was saying there was a Holly. He there's a Hollywood movie he's been thinking about making, coming back to the studio. System. Shang Chi too, yeah, he's been thinking about that for a long time. <laughs> Legend of the he's Eleven like, Rings. I can't wait to make it. Someone just needs to make Shang Chi one. Right, and then they did, and he was like, "All right, I'm on this." Like, my right take is Shang Chi is a man who's very good at fighting, and he has the Ten Rings. But for me, what if the rings were Nazis? <laughs> the, the Ten Nazis. Shang Chi rings him. is one Nazi. This this Verhoeven impression is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we 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 had fun Refined. with him back in the day, yeah. you know, doing bringing Paul out of the bed. Right. <laughs> Here's my pitch for Sonic Three. You have the Sonic and the Knuckles and the Tails, and they are the friends, and they collect the rings, but also they use the rings to have sex with each other. <laughs> sex is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I'm the only one who shows sex the way it actually is. Um, but yes, uh, this this is one of those movies where I I hope he continues making films. But you're like, if through poor luck, this ends up being Paul Verhoeven's last film, you're like, this is kind of a pretty good summation of everything this guy stands it, to do. It is. And it's also a nice, uh, a nice way for him to, to discuss Christianity and, and Jesus. Which has been... A, kind of a low-key... Lifelong, lifelong, academic obsession. Right. That's the thing. It's not even that much a part of his films, although Robocop is the American Jesus. Right. But he has this whole sort of like side like that movie? career. Have I ever said that? Do you like that movie? I did. I watched it last night. Um, I watched <laughs> it again last night. Um, did course. you watch Benedetta or did you just sort of fire up Robocop? <laughs> no, I watched Benedetta. So Benedetta is about a robot cop. Um, I watched Benedetta and I chased it with Robocop. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? No, but he has this sort of side career as this, like, one of the preeminent Jesus scholars in the world. But not just Jesus, the historical this Jesus. Is the thing. Sure, He's not, fascinated not, by yeah, Jesus yeah, the, as the, a historical figure, the, the man. The, the real record about this person. Right, it's not yes. a theological study of the guy. And he's compared, he's written a book called mm -hmm. Jesus of Nazareth. Yes. Which is, you know, an academic study of the historical Jesus. And he also has compared this historical Jesus to someone like, Che Guevara. Right. Yes. Yeah. As a sort of socialist right. leader of the people, a revolutionary. A, revolutionary. a Jewish right. revolutionary, right. basically, whose uh, myth got kind of altered and built upon and turned into more magical things over the Much like millennia. Robocop. It got distorted into Robocop 2, 3. 
the animated series the remake <laughs> right right, yeah, right. there yeah. was a pure there was a real man there was a real man named alex murphy who was robocop and we've distorted his legacy i do think there was at some point a jesus movie he wanted to make yes. that has never come to fruition right. he's, he's right. always like, wanted to make his jesus movie mm-hmm. he also um wanted to tackle the crusades mm-hmm. very famously in the 90s after basic instinct he was going to reteam with arnold to make his you know big budget crusades epic which one can only imagine unfortunately never happened yeah and so now with benedetta it is cool for us you know verhoven heads to finally see him the thing that's interesting make a film about religion and it's pretty much angle at it because right because when you go like for Hoven non-sploitation movie, you're like, is he just going to go fucking maximalist? Is this just him going like full sort of shock value or whatever? Right. And you're like, no, the spine of this thing really ties into so much of what he's interested mm-hmm. in. And then there's sort of the Verhoeven salaciousness on top of it. We should mention, of course, our guest joining us here today is Marie Barty, Party Barty. Hey, guys ooh, ooh, and gals ooh, ooh, and ow. non-binary folks. Uh, you went to Catholic school, correct? I did. Uh, Ooh, did I went, you? Yeah. Are, are any of you guys Catholic? No. No, but I come from a, a very Catholic family on my mom's side. But you were raised atheist. I've never been to church. You've never been to nor church. Nor do I know. Were right. you baptized? Well, you tried to tr- cross the threshold of a church once and you were thrown out right? yeah, by, actually, by an unseen weird. force yeah right. it's yeah. really weird yeah. it was kind of like <laughs> old... not even thrown out just propelled back yeah exactly you were like right. oh, i'll check out saint paul's cathedral or like <laughs> and then i just ended up in a trash can behind the church in an alley it was crazy <laughs> and the church boomed <laughs> cross not the door yeah. no, anyway all right carry on sorry you're, yeah. you're catholic yeah. your mom is catholic but she's a lapsed catholic, but she's not well yeah not so no it. religion right. in my right. your parents raised you it was a and and a religious. This house. guy would come to your house every Friday. This kind of short guy who created this TV show. You know, he had like a little goatee, and he would tell you about how God isn't real. What is this? I need your face. They'd be okay. like, Ben, your religious education is about to begin, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys know how old Ricky Gervais is? Uh, 110. No, take, I don't take know a real old. guess. Don't look it up. Uh, take a real guess. I, I'm guessing he's 58. 63. 60. I just, yeah. it's one of those things where it's its not surprising, but you just do have to step back and go passage of time, huh? That guy I, is 60. I'm less shocked by that because when he emerged in Britain, he was one of those guys right. who had been trying to emerge for a full 10 right. years. You're like, already. he's like right. 40 when the office He was happens. like 40, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it just is a little bit fascinating to think about he's 60 and he's still acting this way. <laughs> <laughs> what way would that be? Nothing. Uh, t- speaking truth to power? Is that yeah. what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah acting this way. Do that? Courageous. <laughs> He was the real Benedetta of our time, right? I hope he hosts the Golden Globes one more time, but well, in its press release form. Well, and I hope when he comes back to host it, he tells us how he hates it and he never wants he to do it, it ever They again. didn't want him. And it's literally the last time. They didn't want him. He didn't want to do it. Weird how it ended up this way. Uh, come on. What's up? Oh, so anyway, so uh, I don't know anything. Sure. You don't know anything about Catholicism. No, nothing. I was not baptized. But then here's the thing. I'm okay. talking to my mom about the friggin' movie, mm-hmm. right? She goes, hey, Ben. Do you know that there's a saint in our family? What? what? So I'm related to the guy who founded the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> how how, how that, closely that, related are you saint to this Columba? man? His name is Father Michael McGivney. Yeah, Michael oh, McGivney. Right. This fella right here. He's giving me a little haws. Oh, and sure. He's, he's a saint? Uh, he's, yeah, he's beatified. He's, oh, been, he's beatified. Been, he is actually not a saint. Oh. He's That's blessed. That's how you pronounce it. Okay. Blessed. You know, right. but he's... He's right. on the road he's on, to he's sainthood. On the, the road to sainthood. Apparently, a second miracle uh, will be required for his canonization. So you just got to take a one on more it. miracle. Wow. Dude, this I mean, guys, please start praying. Your podcasting career could be seen as a miracle. I don't know if that... That's like, true. Like, now, that's true. It's kept going. Ben, <laughs> I know your family has long, long history, deep roots in New Jersey. Mm, yeah. was, was this man a, a Jerseyan? He's from Connecticut. Okay, oh, I was going to say, that. I'm surprised because I had heard there were many saints of Newark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Ow. <laughs> I, I that's what I heard. We're coming in hot. Okay. That's what I heard. Yeah, he's day. he's a Connecticut born and raised and died in Connecticut yeah. in those yeah. in that fine, fine nutmeg state. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think for a second what Connecticut <laughs> is. Nutmeg. It's the nutmeg state. 
Um, so McGivney, that's his last name. Yeah. So it's my, is that your mom's side? Are you a McGivney Hosley? Well, it's like the way she explained it was my it's my great great grandmother's sister's son. Sure. Okay. okay yeah, whatever. Cool. Yeah. But if he's, he's like fucking, a you know, first Vatican, cousin eight times could, removed or whatever. They'll invite me to the Vatican. My mom said. If he another miracle happens, family members get oh, to go. Oh, oh, okay, okay. We need one more go. miracle. This he needs, needs to, to happen. The Vatican, man. <laughs> And defensively <laughs> yelling, waving his arms around. I could go to the Vatican. <laughs> if there's one more miracle attributed to him, apparently. So the first miracle. Yeah. Tell us about this first miracle. Uh, is was under investigation uh, and it was approved by Pope Francis. He healed a baby in the womb after the baby was given a 0% chance of survival by doctors. And giving a knowing nod. As um, if, yep. Oh, no, but this is the whole thing. It's like someone that right, he didn't even do it. Someone prayed to him. Okay. And like the baby lived yeah, or whatever. That, that's, and that's right. That's, yeah. that's how it happened. I know. It, it's just Saints, like, I, it, you don't I, become a saint when you're alive. Right. Well, no, no, of course not. That would be. So you retroactively, be retroactively, the credit is given when the prayer works. I guess so. Correct. But I mean, like, yes, but it's not like they're going back in history and it's like, oh, yeah, he like, one day, this one time he turned water into wine. No, sure. no one can, ever mentioned that? Can we chalk up like a recent miracle to McGivney? And we probably could. Well, we okay. I mean, Nick Vallelonga has two Academy Awards. Is that... <laughs> you think Nick was praying every night to the think he founder wasn't? of the Knights of Columbus? Maybe he has a long list. Nick I don't Vallelonga? Know. You think he just went, I don't know, I think I got a good <laughs> do shot. Do you think that means Pope Francis has to watch Green Book? And he was like, Ooh, this thing. He, <laughs> he, won, he won two Oscars Explain for to this. Me the, so what, it's a story by credit. Yeah, but technically Holy that Father, gets him they, in. they give it a separate award for screenplay. I know they do. This this one. Screenplay? But he didn't like type the script that they used. Right? He did an early draft. It was rewritten, okay. but he's grandfathered into the. I, I'm fifty fifty on this. Well, it also won the Golden Globe for comedy for drama. <laughs> okay, miracle, <laughs> miracle stamp. Full miracle. No, I think it actually so, was Ben, can I tell you something really exciting it's that you might not know about uh, saints? Sure. So apparently their bodies aren't supposed to decompose. Oh, like if you went and checked them out? If they you, would so just that's like another way to prove that he's the saint uh-huh. is that his body in his coffin should just be chilling. Unlike jeans, if you bury a saint, they will never. No, ben is around looking for around for an, a digging implement, <laughs> and I'd like him to stop. Things we know I he think has. This, I don't want him to get arrested for by, This would be a really by, quick and easy way. Imagine how mad yeah. to prove your local case. Catholics yeah. would be if Ben desecrated the corpse of the founder <laughs> Imagine of the Ben's Knights of Columbus. I'm <laughs> Listen, I'm related to this friggin' guy. And then, like, in court, it's like, this man has been seen burying many objects yeah. on his property. Yeah. David. Yes. I'm something of a, a research nut. I don't know if you know this. I like to do my own research. Oh, I didn't know that. You, you're okay. That's, that can lead you down some weird paths. Uh, I don't think so. Look, we hired Nick and JJ to do uh, research for the podcast, and they've been doing a great job. But I like to do my own research in some other areas. It means you're jonesing for research. It does. It does. And research, David, increasingly shows that a healthy gut microbiome is crucial to a healthy life. That is actually true. Uh, I don't. I don't know how you figured that out, but Pendulum Therapeutics—that's the first and only biotech uh, company to isolate important beneficial bacterial strains and put that strain into a convenient no, new probiotic-rich capsule formulated to help manage type two diabetes and nurture your body's microbiome. I assume that showed up in your research too. It did, and I'll even add on to that. Pendulum Glucose Control is the first and only medical probiotic clinically shown to help manage type 2 diabetes when taken with medication. Uh, thank you for showing that up in your research. Look. Can I tell you another I, finding of mine? I don't mean yeah, to big dog I, I, you here. I was looking for a little more. I was, yeah, exactly. I was hoping you had a little more for me. I have found in my research personally that over time people with type 2 diabetes lose the gut bacteria that help them digest fiber and manage blood glucose levels. Maybe I have diabetes. For those with type 2 diabetes, diet and exercise alone are often not enough to manage it. The best approach emphasizes diet, exercise, and a healthy gut microbiome. This connection, David, has been widely recognized by leading scientists studying diabetes, including the American Diabetes Association, Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins, and more. So this isn't just my research. Don't take my word for it. 
But it is a problem I have anytime I research any health condition, which I go, hmm, I probably have that too. Because my body just generally doesn't work. Your, your blood has been tested, so I think you're okay, I, don't know. I assume, recently. We'll but see. look, pendulum glucose control is designed to lower A1C and after-meal blood glucose levels to help you manage your type 2 diabetes. Uh, it can feel a bit of an uphill battle to keep that post-meal blood sugar and A1C levels right where you need them, so pendulum glucose control can help. If you've struggled to manage those levels with diet and exercise alone, your gut microbiome might need attention. Pendulum glucose control, it's going to fill the gaps between diet and exercise uh, you're going to feel in control of your levels, not the other way around. They've got a whole team of scientists, doctors, and innovators who've isolated unique strains of beneficial gut bacteria, helping people with type 2 diabetes manage their blood sugar levels, Griffin. Now, David, David, I don't know if you know this. Pendulum is the only place to purchase a newly isolated, highly sought after strain called Ackermansia. It's the only place. It's like a limited drop. It's like a capsule release. OK, and it's formulated and bottled in the U.S. with the highest safety and quality standards, non-GMO project verified. I didn't know that. So thank you for telling me that. Now, listen, if, if you or someone you love has type 2 diabetes, take control of glucose levels, with pendulum glucose control. Use code check at pendulumlife.com to get 20 percent off all products. That's P-E-N-D-U-L-U-M-L-I-F-E dot com. Pendulumlife.com. Promo code check for 20 percent off. Now, look, you might be surprised that Wilford Brimley didn't show up in this ad read, but there was a scheduling kerfuffle and we have four ads in this episode. So no time for bits. Another fun saint fact. Have you heard the term relic as, as it's used with saints? The 90s movie, The Relic. Well, yeah. yes. But okay. if you have a relic of a saint, do you know what that means? No. You have a piece of their body. Oh, yeah. Mm. Like it's a like, chip of you'll, bone. You'll, you'll go to some, some bone. right. You'll go to some church yeah. in Italy, yeah, and they'll dude, be like, "Well, of course chips. we have like ex saints femur, and it's right. like you know on display." Yeah. And you're like, "Okay." Well, I growing up, I went to Catholic school for twelve years, mm -hmm. and we had a field trip once to go see the shrine of Saint John Newman, who mm -hmm. I guess is a conveniently located Pennsylvania saint. Mm -hmm. There he is. And, I'm looking at him. Yeah, yeah the, and in the center of the shrine, it's just this dead body in a glass coffin Ooh. and there's a mask a oh. lifelike mask on him that approximates what his face would look like <laughs> this isn't a joke well this, you is, were a hundred, that, this is a hundred this is a hundred percent no no when you were explaining that marie the look on ben's face i could see the wheels turning of like maybe i like catholicism <laughs> you're finally selling him on organized religion <laughs> what if like I, this is just all part of a long con for me to convert I'm all collecting of you bones? Well, are okay. you a, are you a practicing catholic i'm not a practicing party? catholic no, i mean okay. i'm i'm italian Sure. So, like, I it's understand. connected to my ethnicity. This was, this was my other question yeah. I was going to ask is, we know you went to Catholic school because it came up in our old episode. You right. went to the Wide Awake School. Right. Uh, how much was that, like, a thing? How much was Catholicism a part of your family life versus just your education? Like, was it a thing that was upheld no. in the home? No. It no. was just you had... And your okay. mom is not No, my Italian, mom. Right? my mom is Catholic. Oh, my mom's okay, not both, Italian. My mom's Lebanese. Right. I, know, um, so I knew that. But, but they're both Catholic on both sides. They're, I'm Catholic mm -hmm. on both sides. Uh, and but your parents themselves are not strong. Were you no. uh, confirmed? Or oh yeah, that? I, right. I yeah, yeah, yeah. got all the sacraments. I'm confirmed. My patron saint is Cecilia. Nice. You haven't been the... verified yet, though, right? We haven't been verified. Do you have a blue check? I confirmed, we don't, you don't have, have a blue check. I'm confirmed. I'm unverified. I have to, you know, update Saint the blank Cecilia, check website to she, get us verified. Uh, Patron of music, She's right? She's the patron of music Playing and the, the subject of the Simon and Garfunkel song, Cecilia, which is not about a girlfriend. Oh. It's about the patron of music. And how horny they are for her. Uh, yeah. And well, Down on my knees. I'm Just begging you, please, to come. It's, he's waiting for inspiration. Right. Sure. But as in that song mm -hmm. and in the film Benedetta, mm. there is a lot of overlap between sexual desire and faith. I mean, look, you're thinking about these people all the dang time. Yeah. You're not allowed to do anything. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. And gotta wear burlap sacks. There's been a long history in Catholic art of knitting saints stuff. and Jesus being like naked and muscular. Yeah. So hot. So I mean, when you think about not just Jesus, I think St. Sebastian is the he's the most one who's common, with all the arrows he's the one with all the arrows yeah. he's kind of a, an early gay icon mm -hmm. whenever you're in like a european art museum and you're going through and it's like you see saint sebastian right like the fucking arrow guy it's yeah like, every hundred every 10 years someone's like i'm gonna draw the arrow guy you know yeah it's, a, it's a strong cool. image yeah yeah um but 
uh, Catholicism, which was sort of like the dominant thing mm -hmm. in life for the first, I don't know, like for a lot of the this is 16 set in the Renaissance, 1700 but years. It was of, the original Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? It the was the people built their was, lives around despite its inherent silliness. It was the dominant cultural product. <laughs> well, it was people the get, culture. Look, it, people yeah. get married and govern their sex lives according to the MCU. So it's, yeah. a, it's, yeah. it's not even good, it's, it's actually a, it's a pretty pretty strong to, yeah, comparison joking. you're drawing yeah. there. But it was a way that people could express themselves in you know if if you're an artist today, you yeah. can make art about whatever. But back then, you could kind of only make art about one thing. So they would well, but Marie, once again, it used to be if you were an artist, you could make art about whatever. Right, but now you can only make Marvel movies. Size, it kind of has to be. <laughs> yeah. Right. And Feige is kind of... Uh, the Pope? A little bit. Il Papa. Right? I mean, look. Papa, Papa Feige. <laughs> Papa, Papa Kev. Um, no, no, no. I mean, it, but it's not just that it was the only... It was like, it's the only thing you fucking learned about in school. The only right. damn books you read were about. It's right. not like you could crack open, you know the latest Jack Reacher back in the 1600s. Right. It had to be yeah. like, okay, I guess I'll read the Bible again. Right. Nowadays, we call it the good book. Back then, they used to call it the only yeah, book. Yeah, the book. Yeah, come to the library. We got one book. You'll love it. <laughs> it's checked out. <laughs> okay. uh, David and I are Jewish. We should clarify. I am Jewish. I have studied the Bible as literature uh, in have. college. I love the Bible. I think it's wild and wacky. And of course, you know, us Jews, we have the first half of, of your yeah, Bible, too. So, yeah, there's a lot of, Jesus yeah. was a Jew. There's a lot of sure overlap. Was. He was um, a hot Jew, according to Paul Verhoeven. Were you a hot sword swinging Jew? Yes. Were you raised religious at all? I was taken to like sort of high holiday services. Yeah. As I guess a sort of half like my mom feeling guilty because she was raised religious. Mm -hmm. Although that kind of like 50s Jewish thing of like, we're Americans. Right. First and foremost. We right. don't want anyone questioning that. Right. We're going to call our kids good American names. And we're yeah. going to, you know, like, because all her uh, older, you know, it's like Shlomo and, That's, you know, I mean, my Prime dad's side and, of the family know, is very that. similar to your mom's side of the family where it's but like all the New kids, York State. Like Daniel, Jews, Robert, right, right, Ellen, right. you know, these, that's in my mind, you know, like, um, but they were religious. They went to yeah. synagogue. Are you, are, did you guys get bar mitzvahed? Didn't. Did not. <laughs> This is what? the thing. I was the first of three kids. There was a fair amount of like high holiday tradition, but it felt like our Judaism was always cultural, like trying to tie ourselves yeah. more to the past. But would you have a Seder? My parents giving any shit about this? Because we would have a Seder. We, we took Passover seriously. We would do Passover. We would do... Uh, you'd go to synagogue for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, yeah. you know. That's pretty much it. Hanukkah was a pretty half Hanukkah, you get presents, we, you light the candles. But we, we really went more for Christmas. Uh, and just um, pizzazz. I can't think of anything else we celebrated. Why would you pass up the well, chance to have an awesome I, party? No, I don't want anyone making fun of me right now. Okay, I'm going to have a similar embarrassing story. I want to hear yours first. <laughs> no, there's a reason I don't. If I had stayed in New York, I think I would have. But I moved to London right. when I was nine they years have, old. They don't have a lot of mm. Jews over there, well, do they? Well, not to... Hey, be, sorry, I was just out of the room. What's going on? <laughs> not to cast, to, to, in, to paint in broad I'll fill you in on the story as he goes along. Why so, are you to, covered in dirt? <laughs> don't worry. Uh, not to paint in broad brushes about British Judaism, but... Do you have it, a bag that says bone chips on it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, David, go on. Um, <laughs> relics? <laughs> you crossed that out and wrote relic. Um, uh, I f we found in Britain that it was like, you're either going to be, if you're Jewish, you're either going to be like super secular and really Sorry, not I just do want anything. Sorry, quickly because I zoned out for a second. Uh, in New York, you found in New York when that's point where the story is taking place. Uh, no, this is in London. What? Go on. Um, no, it's like uh, you. It's like the Jews. The Jewish communities we found were fairly religious. We struggled to find a sort of "quote unquote" reform. Obviously, they exist. They're much smaller. Yep. We never really connected to anything mm -hmm. that made sense for us to do a bar mitzvah. So we never really. I think if it stayed in New York, I would have done a classic kind of like reform Jewish bar mitzvah. Have you thought about what your theme would have been? No, not really. That's a good question. What should my theme? Have oh, been? I mean, I've thought about that. I, Go ahead. I'm not Jewish, but I grew up in a very Jewish neighborhood outside of philadelphia and uh you know my my sister who went to public school went to like 30 bar and bat mitzvahs i went to seventh grade. many many bar mitzvahs yeah. yes yes but i always wanted mine to be an oscars theme oh of course 
Uh, like, see, you that know, would be a red right. carpet. I, mean, I guess a, a Hollywood's movie theme. Biggest night. Yeah. A movie theme would have probably been where I yes. grab it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, the whole thing with Bar Mitzvah, I'm sure you like, some of them would be like the glitziest oh, fucking affairs. Where Ice like, luges. Right. Where you're like, did yeah. the kid even get consulted? This is just like a really grown up party. Yeah. Yes. And others would be more like sort of fun and fancy free. My parents went to a bar mitzvah once where just all the other parents were out doing like shots from an ice luge and like smoking weed behind the synagogue. I was going to say, I recently had this realization of like, oh, fuck, I'm like 10 years away from getting to go to my friend's kid's bar mitzvahs and I'm looking forward to that. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't think about that. As oldest of three kids, I think my parents were like, the kids should have some sense of religion. Like, it felt like neither of them cared, but they were right. like, I think this is what we're supposed to do. And I just didn't give a shit, but they like sent me to like uh, Hebrew school. Like, I oh, had like once to, a week. A but you went thing. to Hebrew school, but you weren't bar mitzvah. That's the whole point of they Hebrew school. They were trying school. to get me into the idea of doing it. I kept on being like, no, nah, I don't want to do it. And they were like, you get to have a party and people will give you, you so many presents, money and oh envelopes. Yeah. People like would right. clean. Right. There, oh. there was one Jewish girl who went to my school. Her name was Meryl. And uh -huh. Meryl was like three years older than me. Mm -hmm. But like rumors of her bat mitzvah trickled down yeah. to the fourth grade. And the big thing was that like, I don't know, in this game of telephone, how wrong this was. Oh. But apparently... Both sets of grandparents gave her those cool mm -hmm. IMAX that were candy colored. Fuck. And they, they, the grandparents didn't consult with each other. So they Fuck. each bought, she had two IMAX for her bot mitzvah. So this is. You could have gotten two IMAX. This is my thing. And I, I don't, I, I just, I was, an, I was a very opinionated kid. I'm not surprised. And I had this whole stance of just like, I think it's kind of gross. That I, you're encouraging me to do this thing that I openly don't care about so I can have a party and get a bunch of presents. Were you also concerned about the whole thing of like becoming a man? Like you wanted to stay a boy forever? Well, my thing. <laughs> Peter Pan. No, thing. Very, very valid question. <laughs> I think my thing was that I simultaneously was like, the only thing I don't want to be is a teenager. Mm. I'm happy being 12. I'd love to be 25. I right. do not want to be a teenager. To, to I was make like, the jump. This sure. seems shitty. Everything I hear about teenagers sucks. Were your siblings bar? No, they didn't even make the effort with my siblings. They're just like, well, I feel I like Romilly would have had a great bot mitzvah. She would have, yeah. But it was that weird thing of just like my parents made me do like all the fucking college admission shit too. And with my siblings, they were like, I don't know, what do you want to do? Um, they we should probably get back to Benedetta. But 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 did you finish <laughs> your story? Is, I'm, okay. I'm I'm very uh, agnostic. Uh, yeah, person yeah. when it comes to all of this, and unlike David, I haven't studied the Bible as literature. But didn't you go I to NYU? It's so wild. No. I thought you did. I went to Keller. You went to Keller and Arts. dropped out. I That's thought you were at NYU for like a semester. Keller. No, I just, I dropped out and then hung out with NYU people. All the time. That's probably why I got confused. Because at NYU, NYU freshman year, we all had to read the Bible. Okay. Yeah, no, never, never did. Yeah. Never did. At you had to read the Bible because it was, you were told it was the truth. Uh, no. No. Yeah. I'm joking. Uh, um, Keller's, we all had to read a book about Chuck Jones. <laughs> similar? Yeah. To Jesus what I Christ? Call the Bible. It's called like Bugs Seven Bunny Seven. is, it was we just, or as you guys discussed in the Space Jam episode, yeah, Christ like theory. figure. Christ like figure. Um, okay, so this movie, Benedetta. Benedetta. I, all this to say, I saw this last night. Where so did you see it? You watched Lincoln's, Benedetta last night? It's, a, it's still processing review wow. for, for old Griffey Nooms. You saw it at Lincoln Center? I saw it at AMC 40 Seconds. Interesting. It's AMC 40 Seconds. It is. Interesting it's got, place. It's <laughs> playing at like six screens in New York right now. It is. It's place. also at Alamo. Uh, I saw it at Nighthawk. Yes. I got a Sunday. Nighthawk. Nighthawk. And it's like, syndicated over in Bushwick. Right. Right. And it's playing at 42nd Street and it's playing at uh, Lincoln Center. It's getting a somewhat oh, limited yeah. release and is going on to... Is, is it already rentable now? Or is no. It's going to be rentable next week. They changed it. Okay. Oh, they changed it. Yeah. Well, it was supposed to be day and date oh, sure, really. on VOD. Next, next and week. now it's next week. Um... I've seen Benedetta twice. Okay. I, and you, and you saw it first at the film festival a while I ago. I saw it at the New York Film Festival. It was very exciting. There were uh, Catholic protesters outside with yeah, bagpipes. Like eight of them. There were eight of them. Uh, we, they, they also protested when we were voting for the Critics Circle. And I was like, it's eight of you. Like, what is this? And they're still like, they're showing up outside of screenings at Lincoln Center today. Like fucking every day. Down but it's, with this it's sort of less thing. than 10. What are yeah. they mad about? Lesbians. Oh, okay. They specifically have like a sign that says like no lesbians. It'd be funny if it just said lesbians. But yeah. isn't isn't that a, isn't this like 
there's real. like recorded history of oh, this. Oh yeah, it's based on a real story. So what are they mad about? I don't know. Why don't you go fucking ask? I don't think they've seen the movie. I was going to say, I was going to (laughs) say, I did not know this was based on a real story until the final title cards came up, right? Because I've been trying to keep myself clean of this. I'm just like, I want to see whatever fucking wacky Paul's doing. So at the end when I was like, oh, he's like pulling from real shit here. I thought like, if this is just from the twisted mind of Paul Verhoeven, I'm like, this must piss them off like crazy. Right. Well, it's a real person and much like his studies of Jesus, he's just accounting for like, Look, we can interpret whether or not these were real phenomenon, but the person, their actions were real. Uh, the outrage is kind of funny because it is sort of what the movie is about. Right. The, although I'll say the outrage has been muted. We're not, a, sure, we don't no. have a, what, a Last Temptation or Christ situation. No, no, no one's really. There's too. really only like one bagpipe player outside of this. No, place. people are not nearly as angry as they were when the first Sonic design was release yeah exactly right that was 500 times angrier right yes i'm still processing a lot of this movie and also try trying to understand the uh the historical significance of this in a lot of ways so the histor so benedetta carlini is- ben saw this week name. david and marie have seen it twice now I saw, and right, had I, more time to digest. Right. i saw it at a press screening i rewatched my i had a screener of it so i rewatched that this morning um Benedetta Carlini was a real woman who mm-hmm. existed in Italy in the 17th century. Mm-hmm. And uh, she is interesting as a historical figure because she is one of the only women who was not an aristocrat who we have historic records of. Interesting. It's similar to The Last Duel in that way, uh-huh. which is also right, based women on are a true so story. Rarely, right, actually in the records. Where we have yeah. court records of the existence of this woman's life. Uh, She was uh, promised to a community of spiritual women. It was not yet a convent. Okay. So they weren't officially sanctioned by the Catholic Church. Right, this movie kind of cleans that up just because it's too complicated. Um, And she uh, was uh, promised because when she was born, It was a very difficult labor, and they didn't think that she was going to survive. Mm -hmm. And her parents prayed, and she came out alive, and her mother survived, which was not always the case. Benedetta. So she came into this world with Jesus on her side. Mm -hmm. And as uh, she grew up and established herself as part of this community of spiritual women, she... um, started to experience visions of Christ and uh, people started to pay attention to her. There, there's so much other shit too, like the nightingale right. would sing to her as a child right. and she would talk to the nightingale and it would like obey her. A dog came and tried to steal her away mm-hmm. and they were like, this dog is an agent of Satan. Like, and that's what's going on there. Right. Like stuff like that. You know, so people she, are bored. Yes. Not to, not to diminish. And uh, up until this point in the Catholic Church, mysticism was a very common aspect of things. Mm-hmm. There, people people were bored. having a lot of religious visions. They were bored. And they also, also, yeah, they're probably getting ill. God knows what they're doing out there. I mean, there. I don't know if lead paint was a thing. <laughs> but yeah, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. doesn't exist. Right. You know? So people, and mysticism and these really like elaborate visions of sure, Christ, sure. very um, elaborate portrayals of Christ and in you're reading, art. Are you reading this book that's full of magic? All kinds of wacky also, magic? Over and over again, the entire culture is built around it. It's like one of the only things you talk about. Right. It's hard not to have everything processed through. This right. must be this. This must be right. divine intervention. The most weird thing about religion where they're like, man, life used to be magic. Fucking beasts and right. people transforming right. shit. And it's like, well, why is my life so shitty? I live in a poop hole. Like, yeah. And my kids are all dead. And it's like, well, just read the book. Hey, come on. This right. stuff it's is really good. Yeah. 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 Right. Ben- Benedetta would have these visions and she'd be very vocal about it. And people started to listen to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and she probably would have continued uh, being this mystic figure with a lot of respect from her community. Mm-hmm. If she, two things didn't happen. The first being this history of mysticism within the Catholic Church was starting to get squashed by the uh, Catholic Counter-Reformation. 
So you have the Reformation happening in Protestantism with Martin Luther and all that stuff that's sort of reforming that aspect of the church. Then in Catholicism, they were like, oh shit, we kind of have to catch up to that. So mm-hmm. let's rein in the crazy. Sure. Let's not, you know, we don't want people thinking we're like a religion of loonies. loonies. Right, right. So let, let's tone down these mystical we can't, visions. We can't just have every local freaking right. so-and-so being like, Jesus talked to me yesterday. He said I get to eat three sandwiches. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was happening. And then the real Benedetta was uh, she, she said she had this vision where Jesus had asked her to marry him. Right. And she wanted to stage an elaborate wedding to Christ. And she was very particular about all of the like supporting actors that would be in this kind of staged presentation of her wedding. It's her wedding. Should, I mean, she she's a bit have, of a bridezilla. She, yeah, come on. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that was just like a little too, she just kind of went overboard with the theatricality of it. And that's when people started to question her and start to try and bring her down. Okay, but Ugh, flower arrangements. I mean, have, you just, watch any season of 90 Day Fiance and people <laughs> right. freak Say out yes for to a the dress. Months. Yeah. yeah. She also had stigmata. As right. She, she had you know. the stigmata, which originally was considered like irrevocable proof of her, you know, real yeah. relationship with Jesus. But, you know, after the wedding, mm-hmm. other people came into the picture and started to question. Nuncios start showing up. Eventually, right. they start asking questions as depicted in this movie. Right. Mm-hmm. Turns out she'd done some light fraudage with another <laughs> nun. <laughs> I don't think the... Uh, yeah, what level of historical record is that? The, yes, so... Uh, definitely was found to there have, was yeah, there, consorted. There is within the... Uh, Bartolomea. Within the court records, Bartolomea, who is the sort of young novice in the mm-hmm. film and also existed in real life. Also a really fun name to say. Both of these characters' Bo- names Bartolomea. are... Bartolomea. Really, I mean, incredible names. Benedetta. I would have thought they were made up if they weren't real. Me too. That's why I was just like, yeah. oh, Paul Verhoeven's making a lesbian nun film called Benedetta. It's funny. It's like Vendetta. It's so want, lurid. Right. Do you want me to read you the actual testimony of what they did? Yeah, because yeah. it's funny. <laughs> Benedetta then, for two continuous years, at least three times a week, in the evening, after disrobing and going to bed, would wait for her companion to disrobe and pretending to need her, and that's the real sin, mm. lying, would call out... Bartolome would come over, Benedetta would grab her by the arm and throw her by force onto the bed, embracing her. She would put her under herself and kissing her as if she was a man. She would speak words of love to her and she would stir on top of her so much that both of them corrupted themselves. Sort of a huh. euphemism there that you got to yeah. catch all. Sure. Yeah. I like anyway, the euphemism. Basically, yeah. she's behaving as a man is sort of the right. most yes. yeah. the, di- the difference between the events in the film and what, you know, the actual court testimony the court testimony um benedetta claims that she was being possessed by a demon named spirito dello i Mm -hmm. think correct uh sorry splendid to dello splendid to dello another incredible name horny demon (laughs) yeah uh yeah she was like it was it was the that that guy did it right so in, in real life she said she was possessed in the movie no, well, she's, look, this she's is all whole, woman. This is the whole thing about the But it's also kind of Jesus flowing through her. Exactly. Right. And he's hot. He's this hot. This guy yeah. is H-O-T. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, David? The whole thing about this movie? Well, it's like the whole time you're like, wait, does she believe her own bullshit or is she, you know. That's the big question. Really, really smart. Shit. I mean, that's, right. that's what I find fascinating about that. Of course, I'm not surprised that people are upset about this movie. The very people who, of course, were destined to be upset about this movie and will never, ever even consider watching it or reading about what it's actually doing. But, as I said, not knowing the actual story, not knowing it was even based on a real story, just seeing the fucking posters where I feel like it was like cleavage with a cross fucking Yeah, the original poster was like, like a penis. little hint of nipple. Right. It, it was just in like... In a non-habit. He's just going full like fucking, like what, what's it called? Devil's Candy, the fake movie at the beginning of Tropic Thunder. Yeah, like, yeah, he's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, It felt to me Satan's like, Alley. Satan's Alley. Alley. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Devil's Candy's a real movie. <laughs> I know. Uh, Satan's Alley, uh, That that's what it felt like at, where I was just like, and I would have been down for that. Like, just Paul being like, ah, fuck you. I'm right. going to make them kiss each other a lot. But he does have a reverence for 
the That's subject matter, what which is so cool. It's interesting about this. And I think he's really trying to make a, I think he's trying to contend with people's relationship to religion, right. both individual and cultural. And uh, he's doing that through a, a, a specific story and a character that really tests a lot of our beliefs. I don't know. I mean, it, it, there, there is, there's very interesting uh, area for interpretation in this movie. Sure. And I feel like he does not Which I love. really come down on. Well, yes. I, I prefer this to the other version where we're either seeing someone who just completely is, you know, believes this is what's happening mm -hmm. or the person who is, we see her planning to stage her stigmata. Or right. What, right. And instead it's like, oh, she had that thing. And were you doing something with that? And she's like, no. And you're like, Okay, like, you know, I don't know what to make right. of that, right? You know, like, there's, it's just sort of planted. And Fairhoven gave an interview with the New York Times recently about Benedetta, and when he sp spoke about what attracted him to this project, mm -hmm. it wasn't just the... Hot Jesus. It wasn't just the Christianity angle. Sure. It was, he wanted to make another film similar to Total Recall and Basic Instinct, where you have... Can you believe this person? Is this real? Right. right. You have this unreliable narrative mm -hmm. and an unreliable protagonist and there is no clear answer and at the end. An unreliable reality. Like, right. I mean, it's so interesting. Religion is the ultimate unreliable reality. Right. Like, I mean, there is no faith is right. believing something without proof. Like, there were the scenes where she's sort of possessed, where he's doing effects on her voice. Like, uh, what's her name in uh, Dune? Yes. <laughs> she Rebecca does the Ferguson voice. in Dune. Right. She does the voice. <laughs> right. And, but it's... If she did that to me, I'd be like... Ooh. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but that's also where you're like, she could just be doing this herself. That's the thing. So yeah. it's like, you can tell they put some sort of post effect on her in those moments. I assume so. But right? it's also not so heightened that it's like impossible that someone could do that with their voice. Especially if you're about to be thrown on a freaking right. burning pie or whatever. I might be right. like, Jesus said that you all suck. And everyone's like, right. oh, he did. Oh, and then shit. you have what? scenes where there's like copious like CGI blood coming out via stigmata. And you're just like, well, that feels like he's putting his thumb on the scale. This has to be taken as real. And then people will like pull up shards of clay and be like, I found this in your fucking pocket. But as, as something that you, because I just listened to the Total Recall episode sure. oh, that you guys did. Interesting. Um, and <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> there's mm. something you said about how the uh, that movie it's is critic like proof. critic proof yes. because no matter what happens, you can say, oh, it was in the the right. dream structure. It right. doesn't matter that the narrative doesn't make sense. And her response to everything, even if she did cut herself right. with glass to create a stigmata, yeah. Jesus made me do it. Of course. That's, you can, always, you can always go back to that. I, right. I personally think that Benedetta believes her bullshit 100%. I think the ending is probably the best confirmation yeah. right. where she's like, I kind of want to go back to the convent, right, she gets, though. Yeah. She quote unquote gets away with it. <laughs> right. Right? right. She has a clean break. And it's like, she does just, not get burned at the stake. You get to Spoiler hang alert. out on a farmhouse and fuck. And she's like, I'm going to go back there. And they're like, they'll burn you. It's like, right. But if they burn me, I'll obviously live because Jesus flows through. Me, so. <laughs> right. right. And right. I, right. I think her religious visions as depicted in the film are genuine to her experience. Sure. Yes. I, yeah, yes. But they might have just been really cool dreams that she had. I mean, they're, they're really Jesus. cool dreams. I wrote down, you know, like I took notes during the movie. Uh, Jesus slashing snakes. Yeah. With That's sword. his first entrance. Though. Yeah, I mean, that was really cool. Right. Um, also, Jesus does not have a penis. Did you guys notice that? Yes. I did, yes. When she I takes off couldn't his little loincloth on the Couldn't tell if it was tucked away cross. or just sort of not there. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. sure what to do. It, it, was, it was, he was tucked, but I Look thought that was a cool yeah. little... No, yeah. yeah, for sure. A little yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, um, and then there's the other sequence where it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's, it's scary, a scary man. man. Yes. Yes. They don't yeah. talk about Jesus going to the bathroom, do they? Like, in, the in the Bible? Did they come from like, Did like, he sit down? Did it's he like Mark put the seat eight, up? 12, and then Jesus went number two. Yeah. And he came out and he said that it was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, and this, this or he was like, whew, don't go in there. You know, <laughs> right. Something like that. This movie talks about going to the bathroom. Yeah, this shows movie it. got some great pooping, it's farting scene. A battle shit scene. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> right. I Googled, did Jesus poop? <laughs> what, what came up? Yeah. An answer on Quora from Peter Francis Joseph DeFazio. Sounds like said, a real Catholic. Yes. Jesus is like us in all ways except sin. He had normal human physiology, so he ate, drank, urinated, and defecated. 
like any other human being. Mm. And in as unsavory a topic as this might seem, while Jesus was a baby, I'm quite certain the Blessed Virgin Mary changed quite a few of his diapers. Oh, that's kind of cute. I think I got to disagree with this read. You, you know, you're out on this. <laughs> you don't think Jesus pooped? Well, no. In my mind, Dookie is the original sin. So, don't. so you're saying he's not without sin. I'm right. saying either he was without sin or he pooped. But you're. what about like it, that this is like the proof of his, you know, godhood is like he pooped without sin. Every time it was an unsinful poop. Do you feel that when you go to the bathroom, <laughs> you're That's sitting? That's the deeper question. Yeah, I do. <laughs> It certainly feels like punishment. I know someone who, as a toddler... I feel like I have to atone afterwards. As a toddler, uh, would go behind the couch to poop and oh. would just kind of stand there. Apparently. With diaper on. With diaper on. Okay. And it was like, yeah, he didn't He didn't want anyone looking. Like, yeah. he would go. Yeah. yeah. When my daughter poops, she mostly just goes, goes like, ah! And, like, looks at me. She's she's definitely not She ashamed. goes full Bobcat gold. She gets, she, <laughs> you'll be like, why are you so wound up? And then you're like, oh, you're pooping. That's yeah. That's what's going on with you. That's right. really funny. Yeah. Um. Okay. This movie starts with her being... It's a little kid. She's a mm-hmm. little yeah. kid and she's being... She's she's paying her tuition, right. essentially. It's got the classic modern Disney princess opening where you start out right. with a little version of the main character so you can sell merch of her. Right. right. And she... Uh, <laughs> Baby Benedetta. She, she talks back. She's very bold with yes. some local bandit types. Mm-hmm. Right. But they're just like, look, I'm telling you, uh, our daughter made for this <laughs> shit. You and gotta then, right. take her. Uh, Rampling, who, by the way... Oh, incredible. Just absolutely taking And, and one the of those pain. people where you cannot believe that she has not worked with Paul Verhoeven yet. I mean, the obvious answer is yeah. I guess he's only made three movies in the last 25 years, 20 years. Also, that you can't believe that she's fucking English. People have almost forgotten that this woman is not you I know. Know, French or Italian. I know. She's an English lady. She's got range. She's, she's so got range. But it's it just she's she's just such a fucking good fit for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is, I also thought it was funny that, like, this opening sequence, I was like, huh, I think he's doing some mild CGI de-aging on Rampling. It, Couldn't it tell felt, if it was a lot of makeup or some CGI. It felt light. There was just She's very smooth. That, I didn't notice it. Sometimes the weird light reflection when people She's have She's got a been, very smooth face. Right. So, I, like, I sensed that, and then I was looking at her parents, and I was like, are they de-aging them a little bit? Right. I or they're they, going to be I later. I think they make them look That's older. That's the thing. Yeah. So it's like they cast the parents at the age they are in only the first scene. And for right. the rest of the movie, they have prosthetics on. Right. And then Rampling, I think, was de-aged a little bit. It's um, possible. Because that seems... Some light beauty work, as we years. call it in the biz. Yes. Yes. But she also... Uh, looks, looks incredible. Good. Right. Looks incredible and just has such a credible presence. Yeah. I guess the reason why I was just like, what a good fit for Verhoeven is just like, Charla Rampling can play Judgment better than almost anyone alive. Right. Just the sort of like withering stare. She's she's got a good wither. Yes. David? Yeah. I love to dig in and do my own research. You do. You're a research fiend. It's been well established by our previous ad read, and somehow that is the opening line of the ad copy of this different ad. Uh, because there's narrative arcs built into this show because we plan things out. There are. And as we've already noted. Look, the show's got its own great independent researchers that we've hired, which is great. But that means that you are absolutely climbing up the walls looking to research anything you can get your hands on that isn't blank check related. I've definitely fallen down some pretty deep Reddit wormholes. It also says in the copy, quote, you're not afraid of homework, which is not true. I'm deathly afraid of homework to the degree (laughs) that I still have nightmares about homework multiple times a week. But if your search, David, for the right people for your company is coming up dry. There's a resource you haven't tapped into yet because if you're hiring, you need Indeed. You need Indeed. Look, it's a hiring partner that gets you what you really want, a short list of quality candidates as fast as possible because you can do it all, attract, interview, and hire all at Indeed. It's very simple. You know, you shouldn't be struggling to find quality candidates. Mm -hmm. Uh, Indeed can help you hire the right people right now. They are with you on every step of the process. You can find talent with the skills you need through tools like Indeed Instant Match, Mm. assessments, Mm. and virtual interviews. Mm. It's all in one place. It's so easy. That's what I love about it. If I had to list one thing off the cuff that I love about Indeed, it's that it's centralized. Uh, Yes. And, you know, they've got over 135 assessment tests from cooking to coding. Mm. Okay. You can pick what skills are important to you. Get a clear view of your top talent abilities faster. And, uh, you know, uh, it's got a very smooth interview process. They don't have to prove themselves again and again. You can just dive deeper 
into what's important to you. With Indeed assessments, you can reduce hiring time by 12% according to Indeed data. And look, I could use that extra time because we have four ads to record this week. Uh, yeah, exactly. We need the time. So get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash check. You can get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash check. Indeed.com slash check. This offer is valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire. You need Indeed. No time for bits. But yes, okay, so she's gifted to them. Right, and Charlotte Rampling is the original abbess mm -hmm. of this. In the film, it's a straight-up convent. It's a convent. They don't, they, yeah, they they don't, don't get, into, get into, the, into the gray areas. Right. Did, but, it, did it become a convent later, or was so, it always So convent? in the okay. film, yeah. it is to Charlotte Rampling and everyone else in the town of yeah. Pesha's yes. advantage that Benedetta become this mystic because that will they legitimize want them they want to okay. believe that she is having these visions because right. in the film they're saying it will bring them fame and fortune because there there sure. is literally a line in the movie where they're like you see what happened to a sissy after saint francis yeah <laughs> that was pretty cool we got to get ourselves a saint right it, 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 she's like uh, rick mackey hoping that uh the williams sisters turn it, out well exactly right yeah. macy Great. god damn it yeah. And I watched like a two hour video of the real Rick Macy the other Who night. is weirder than so yeah, uh, Bernthal in the movie. Down. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked. So much was weird. That was so good. Yeah. Uh, but it is, yeah, it is. And that's an, in, so I kind of want to talk about how Benedetta has a lot of callbacks to past Fairhope mm -hmm. films. Because when we get into this idea of uh, the finances of the convent, mm -hmm. of, uh, people wanting to believe that Benedetta is, you know, real because it will, you know, give them money. I mean, it, the, he's always had a history in his films with kind of being an, I, I don't know if I'd say so much an anti-capitalist, but obviously very critical of yes. capitalism. Yes. And especially in America. Um, yeah, but, and I think, I think the... Uh, the, the dehumanization that results, the, right. priorita the prioritization of right. capitalism above life. Right. But what I think intensifies this all is that the plague is happening. Right. Yeah. Because we have not the, mentioned the plague yet. The stakes are <laughs> yeah. so high. I mean, yes. people are like, they are showing just people strewn, dead bodies strewn in the street. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is awful. And then yet this man, this, you know, who we meet later in the movie, but I'll just run him now. The nuncio, he's just eating food and just like a, and his wife and is squirting concubine milk from her titty. Milk. That, fucking that juxtaposition, it's so <laughs> yeah. fucked up. Yeah. 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 And yes. that is based in reality, especially in Italy at the time. They're like, the, the popes were in like Renaissance Italy. What wasn't one of them like a Medici? Like, yeah, I think so. there was yeah. a lot of corruption within the Catholic Church at the time where like popes were getting married. Mm hmm. People were re making bank off of their religious status. It was a very corrupt environment. Um, and this character, the nuns, the first company. Or, yeah. Yeah. You know what? I mean, I don't know if this is. Uh, Are you going to go back to the Marvel thing? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I wasn't. I, the, uh, a thing maybe that will garner even less excitement from the crowd, I'm about to say, but it was like a thing that, that hit me while watching this. We live in a time where there are increasingly people who want to build their entire identity around the idea that they're anti-cancel culture, right? Mm. And a lot of them are not even people who are ever going to find themselves in the crosshairs. Right. You see these people who are like proactively like cancel culture is the ultimate pox of our time. How dare we? This is inhuman, right? Which like the entire notion of cancel culture, which I don't think really exists, is essentially two phenomena happen simultaneously. One of which is like a long overdue cultural reckoning with things that we have never, ever asked for accountability on, right? Like systemic issues that have always been sort of swept under the rug, ignored, uh, covered up, what have you. And then also just the innate human behavior to want to shame other people to feel better about yourselves, which I think social media has just lit a fucking flame under and given us like super weapons to be able to, to do, right? And then you and, and people want to talk about this as like this modern pox of our time, 
Whereas like all human behavior is just fucking cyclical. We just keep on getting new tools and outlets to be able to do the same basic instincts we have, which are stupid fucking animals. And we're all just afraid we're going to die and we want to eat and have a place to live and all of that. And you watch this movie and you're like, there used to just be a guy like Christopher Lambert, and he just it's like Chris Lambert oh, Wilson. Lambert Fuck, Wilson, crazy I, people. <laughs> I made this mistake before we pressed record. There used the to be like a singular guy, like Lambert Wilson, could just go like, uh, I don't know, sounds guilty to me, and then you drag a person through a town and have everyone yell at them and fucking set them on fire. What else are you like, gonna do that day? But this is my play. Everyone's like cancel, and we just love watching these people oh, suffer. Louis C.K. Oh, just has to see. sit right, in his right, ten right, million right, dollar right, apartment. Cancel culture. We're not talking about himself. cancel culture. No, no, but I think that it is I think it is part of this movie I'm not saying this movie is his commentary on cancel culture but it is these basic human instincts is what cancel culture is a manifestation of is like this purity test we're always fucking doing you know of just like this balance of wanting to idolize people and being like this makes you uncomfortable fuck them they have to be taken down immediately how dare you and in this culture that is so dominated by religion Benedetta is essentially doing the shit that they've all been prepping their entire lives to be able to witness, right? Like the course of Catholicism is like, Jesus is going to fucking come back. He's going to come back for us and some magical shit's going to happen again. Like David was saying, I know like, oh, the book, you read all the magic and now we walk around, everything sucks. But someday the magic guy's going to come back. Magical shit's going to happen. He's going to save us all. And then Benedetta sort of shows up and is like, hey, magical guy flowing through me. Here's some magical shit. And everyone's like, fuck this so hard. You know, there's like such an immediate revulsion to everything she's well, doing. Well, there, there, there is a, a value judgment in the film, which yes. is that the sort of corruption that Charlotte Rampling and some of the other and, and the nuncio, they are corrupt financially. They're mm-hmm. very concerned with money. There's a whole thing about how when Benedetta is promised to the convent that her parents have to pay, you know, a, a, a dowry fee mm-hmm. and Charlotte Rampling is, you know, if if she was a normal bride, you'd have to pay this much money. But just because of, she's a bride of Jesus, you're going to cheapskate me. Sure. And uh, so you know, the money was a was a big thing. And but and that was Bartolomea. What I, I'm fucking up her name, but there's that similar scene because she Bartolomea. Bartolomea is taken in because she's being chased by her father who raped her repeatedly, abusing her. Yeah. And she's trying to escape. Right. But and, but Rampling is like, I, yeah, it seems like a, a bad situation. But Ponto De Niro right, right. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is a convent. Like, they're right. literally aligned. This is a convent, not a charity house, right, which right. is funny. Yeah. Right. And then Benedetta and her parents are both like, come the fuck well, on. Well, no, no. Benedetta's like that. And the parents are like, okay, we'll pay your freaking tuition. I guess right. if you get yeah. away from a rapist dad. Right. Like, so then yeah. like Rampling is negotiating what the prices she'll take. And then once that deal's closed, Ben does dad's like, come on, you're not leaving me out of there. <laughs> right. Like they're going to pay out everybody. But that's, to fucking, that's, yes. that's sanctioned. Of course. Of within, course. within the world of the film, that yes. kind of corruption is fine. Right. Benedetta is, when she becomes the, the abbess, sort of replacing Charlotte Rampling in a, what I thought was a fun little connection to showgirls. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, replacing Crystal. <laughs> yes. Uh, that uh, she is um, not so interested in the finances. There's liter- She literally makes a point of hiding the dildo mm-hmm. in the financial ledger of the convent. They, cut, right. they right. cut out the pages of that book to hide the you religious dildo. Yeah. So, like, she's... Her corruption... It, Corruption in quotes is sexual, and that is inexcusable. Well, right. I think financial corruption is fine, but right. she's and it, crossing a line by it being also queer feels like, and sexual. Exactly right. Her her queerness, the the sexual imp- quote unquote impropriety of her behavior is the thing they're able to hang their hat up on and be like, "See, dead to rights. Come on, how are you going to fucking defend this?" But I also think part of what's interesting about this movie and it is the ambiguity of like, do we buy Benedetta? Does the movie believe in Benedetta or not? Is that you kind of go like the Ramplings, the Lamberts, Wil- Wilsons. They, are they more threatened by her because they think it's a put on or because if it was real, that actually threatens them because more? Because they know it's not real or they think like Rampling but, doesn't buy any of it. But I'm saying both both ways are a threat to them. No, right? 100%. If someone's fucking faking, that's like that undermines their power. But also if she's real, then it's like as Rampling sort of later says in the movie, like, he doesn't speak to me. Right. right. So if he speaks to you, then who the fuck am I? Rampling's running a business. She's right. like, you know, she wants to just run a tight ship over here. We get the money. Right. We make the fucking 
What are the things? The spools? The the bobbins. The, the bobbins. Silk. We send out some bobbins, you but know, it's everyone also like, gets fed. It's not like the end of the world. But, I'm you know. top of the pyramid. You can't know more than I do. But he she can't doesn't, be speaking Rampling's character doesn't have any delusions of grandeur, is what I'm saying. Right. Like, obviously, Lambert sure. Wilson, he's the nuncio. He's like right. a big He's the deal. one I think is more threatened by. Well, he, he's yeah. exactly like, he, they actually need to stamp a Benedetta out. Rampling is just trying to fucking, you know, not rock the boat over here. Mm-hmm. She doesn't want the nuncio coming down mm-hmm. or being like, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that is that is her fatal. Her, that's like right. her right. fatal sin is she brings the nuncio to this. She brings a man into this predominantly female environment, yeah. and he is immediately threatened, which which is a theme mm-hmm. in Verhoeven's films mm-hmm. by a queer woman who an outspoken woman, an outspoken too. queer a, woman, a girl with boss, power. One might say uh, the original girl boss, and she's she's very comfortable in her power. Yeah, she is. I I think it's it's so. D- did you actually watch RoboCop? Yeah, of course. Last I did. night, okay. Because yeah. for me, I watched, I, I I rewatched Benedetta, and then I watched Basic Instinct, The Fourth Man, and Total Recall, and mm-hmm. prep for this. Okay. And I think that I I think the similarities between this and Basic Instinct are actually kind of. They're surprisingly strong. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I think that Benedetta is a Catherine Trammell type character. Sure. Where you don't yes. quite know right. yeah. what she's, yeah. she's, she's driving her, what where she wants to end up. Yeah. She is, she's very again, powerful. like she's a very she's powerful queer, queer woman, yeah. very open with her sexuality. And also, she's creative. Catherine Trammell is a writer. And sure. the whole thing was like she became a suspect because she wrote a book. Right. Right. And right, that was right. the thing that Michael Douglas mm-hmm. is consistently surprised by. Like, why are you doing this? She's like, to learn about you for my book. Right. You're a character in my book. I'm doing research. And he cannot wrap his head around the fact that she's a writer. So is Lambert Wilson's purple <laughs> robes, is that like Michael Douglas's sweater? Is that the parallel there? I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say their clothes are similar. I think they both kind of have these like, their skin feels very like thinly stretched over their faces. They have this like, I wouldn't say it's an overtly macho energy in a traditional sense, mm-hmm. but it is like, um, it, it's a toxic masculinity sure. Sure. in, Absolutely. uh, in Benedetta that the toxicity is literal because he literally brings the plague yes. to the convent. Um, but I, I, I think that um, when talking about Catherine Trammell as a a writer and a creator and something that's not being uh, understood by the man in the film, Benedetta in real life and in the movie is very theatrical. She's mm-hmm. all she. Our first introduction to Benedetta as a grown woman is in the middle of a play that she's the right. star. that she's right. the star she's right. the best one right. she's yeah. good she's she's good people in the audience like my first reaction after seeing benedetta for the first time was like oh she has main character energy before realizing like she's literally the main character in a movie like that's a stupid thing to think um, no but, yeah, no, but she, yeah. she she yes she has a flair for drama the whole thing about her like Dig a grave for me. I'm going to like resurrect myself. Well, this she wants to be carried into the, the square that has been part on donkeys yeah. like Christ. She's very theatrical, and that is what gets her in trouble. You have the in, thing as a child where the statue falls on top of her, right. and everyone, like 75% of the people are like, a sign of blessing. People are like, a little convenient. Right. I mean, and she, she's the one who has the statue fall on top of her. Her being creative yeah. is one of, one of the things that, you know, people want to uh, knock her down for. Can we talk about this actress for a second? Because I, I did some digging. Because I was Virginie like, Efira. She's right. an L. I, she's she's an in Sybil, L. which is uh, kind of a fun movie. Yeah, yeah, that was a good movie. I liked yeah. Sybil. But, but she was uh, like a TV presenter. She yeah. was like she was on like the Belgian or reporter, French version of American Idol or Weather whatever. Weather Woman, like yeah, like yeah. she was on a children's show called Mega Mix. Yeah, she was yeah. like primarily like. A, a very pretty TV presenter. She's very pretty. Very pretty. Mm-hmm. Who then, like, in her 30s, made a pivot. Where you have to imagine there was probably some pushback. Of, like, oh, she wants to do movies now. To mostly, like, romantic comedies that were well-received. And people were like, oh, she's fucking winning. She's getting, like, Cesar nominations. But that's, like, her zone. She mostly does sort of, like, 
lighter, I feel like, adult dramas and romantic comedies, romance-based things. She has the supporting part in Elle as the, the next-door neighbor, the wife of the next-door neighbor. She does. You know the thing I'm about to say. I assume. I mean, if you don't, if you don't say it, I'm going to say it. David's giving me the knowing look. She is, of course, in France, the voice of Mavis in all three Hilta Transylvania That's right. movies. Wow. She's done a lot of dubs, I think. Like there's yes. other dubs that like Garfield her, apparently. That was her breakthrough. So but, that was before she was acting herself. It was like celebrity casting who's a famous person we can get to do the dubs for family movies. And then those were big enough that she started acting on camera again. But this is like a very different role for her. I think she's such fun casting. I in do this too. Movie. It's just like I was watching this and I was like, is this some like legend of French theater? Like, who is this? Why does she look for mine? I saw the L thing. And then I was working backwards from there and I'm like. This is like if like I I I Maria Menudos that like suddenly got like a supporting role in a Verhoeven movie and then he was like you're the star of the next one and she went like fucking ham on it. Well, I think like my friend Kristen after she saw this movie, her review of it was just to send this tweet from a while ago that was like some actors you can't buy in a period piece like Jessica Biel has a face that knows yes. about text messaging yeah, seen a cell phone, and yeah. so her problem with the film was that she thinks Benedetta that she's too modern Be- Benedetta she just looks too modern hmm. you can literally see like the roots in sure. her hair from where she was blonde but my take Benedetta had to be blonde I agree she has to be a movie star I also <laughs> I think this she has to be modern I think she yeah, represents the, thing, she the she threat of feel modernity a little, yeah, right like weirdly confident in a way that doesn't make sense right. like there's the she's this confident little girl who the right. fucking statue falls on and the girl's like hmm does the virgin mary want me to kiss on her titty is that what she's interested <laughs> in but she has the supporting role in Elle where she's very good she gets like she the big last good. scene that's but, her but, big but, that, but her character in Elle of course is the one who leans yes. over to Uber and is like you know thanks for doing all that insane shit with my husband because I'm not really right. into mm-hmm. it right. and yeah. Verhoeven is like prepping this movie and he's just like she impressed me in that last scene I just gave her the part he never tested her he never auditioned her he never talked about it with her well he, he did he called her up and he's like you want to be in my lesbian nun movie she's like okay He's like, there's going to be a sex scene. She's like, cool. He's like, there's a dildo made from a statue of the Virgin Mary. She's like, dildo? Hmm, interesting. Okay. He told her everything <laughs> entailed. I guess the point I read in this interview with her was that, like, she was like, he never talked to me about how I should play the reality of this, what the, right. what the uh, opinion of the movie is, you know? Like, she was like, he gave me complete autonomy to make any of those decisions myself about whether internally I am playing this as a con or as reality, and I decide to play everything with conviction. Which is the right choice, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, but it, it, it's just, uh, yeah, you got to give him credit for recognizing the ability for her to deliver this performance, because it does not sound like it was an obvious pick in any way. Um, she's so good. I think she's great. Um, and uh, I think everyone in this is really good. I think Rampling Rules, obviously, but I really like uh, what her name is, Daphne Pat- Patakia mm-hmm. as Who plays uh, Bartolomea. She just got that kind of like wounded yeah. soul thing feral going animal. on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very feral. Right. right. Um, I like mean old uh, Christina Louise che- Chevillier. Uh-huh. Oh, Chevillier. we haven't talked about Christina yet. The mean girl. Which she, which feels to me like a a fun reference to. Uh, oh my gosh. Why am I blanking on the name of the movie? Black Gina Narcissus. Kirkham. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, yeah, that that whole drama that's that's my least favorite part of the movie, which is sort of the second act that's sort of their power struggle, but it's still good. I'm I, more into the first and last. I mean, the last act is where I was like, the last this is act a great is, movie. is great. I, yeah. I, I, this is paying off for me in huge. Is Lambert much, Wilson being like, you're still fucking lying. When she comes back from the dead. Yeah. That's yeah. when the movie is like really cooking yeah. with gas. Although I enjoyed the whole thing. It isn't, me I too. mean, you're talking, Marie, like the. The, the overlaps with other Verhoeven works, right? It's like, it really is Catherine Trammell for this because then you look at the other, especially within his Hollywood films, right? And it's like, you have the protagonists who are like Robocop and uh, uh, Nomi, Nomi and uh, Showgirls. Showgirls are like innocents, right? They are innocents who show up with a kind of purity and are punished for and then end up coming into their own power and sense of self and being able to work things their own way. And then you have characters like Johnny Rico and uh, Quaid in Total Recall who are kind of just idiots. Right. Who the movie like happens to. And they don't understand that they're pawns within a larger system, whether or not they have any agency or any of that. But like Tremel is, is that 
example of a character where you just don't fucking know exactly whether or not they're on the level and whether it's on you for judging them or questioning them, you know? It's it's an interesting line. And you think about how controversial that movie was when it came out. Right. How outraged people were despite it being a huge fucking blockbuster. It it does make sense that that's that's the thing he's latching onto. But I also think it's like it's like his obsession with Jesus where it's like I think it would be almost impossible for him to make the kind of Jesus movie he wants to make. However, you can pick a figure like Benedetta where similarly there is historical records of some amount of things that happened and you can show them on screen and then debate over whether or not this had any actual supernatural power behind it, which is, I think, what he's into. It's also just like, how would we react if Jesus fucking showed up today? People have spent centuries just going like, come on, he's coming back. He's coming back. And it's like, if he came back, people would probably be like, I don't know. Fuck you. Let's fucking take this guy out back and beat the shit out of him. I don't, bl- I don't buy it for a second. Most, most saints, especially back in medieval times and pre-medieval times were martyrs yeah, right, because no bad. one believed like, them. Right. <laughs> God, you got how much oil poured on you? Ah, oh, shit. It, could you, you could be a saint? Right. Uh, is, that, is that clear it up at all? I know you're dead, but... Like, it's a lot of the black comedy of this movie is that, like, here's you're steeped in this world of, like, the obsession with the imagery, right? And the statues and the paintings and everything everywhere. And that no one stops to, like, check themselves when they start to put her through the exact same shit. Yeah, the ending, man. This is we, we, we can get to it if we want to get. If we, if you guys want to talk about other stuff, that's not. I just want to talk about Lambert Wilson. We can we can talk about Lambert it, it's Wilson. It's just if one, I love the man. Obviously, I mean he's the Merovingian. He's the Merovingian. He's in lots of other. He's in what's it, what's it called? The um, fuck, what is it called? Griff, help me out here. The Wolf movie. Is yeah, Brotherhood of the Wolf. Isn't he in that? Yes, Maybe he's right? not. Yes, am I? Maybe no, I think he not. is. Are we wrong about that? Why do we think that? Did, he's he's pretty, in the Matrix Reloaded, the Matrix Revolutions, the Matrix Resurrection. He is in those. Yeah, he's not in Brotherhood <laughs> of the Wolf. Man, why did what I am I thinking? He's in a De Gaulle biopic. Cool. He played De Gaulle. No, that I didn't realize he was in the new Matrix. Oh, yeah, he did. Yes, he is. Oh yeah, that's what a year for him. I know. He's in Catwoman, of course. That's mm. right. He's the villain in Catwoman. I guess well, Sharon, Stone's Sharon Stone's the main Stone. one, yes. but he's sort of the. The sort of one who invented the de aging cream or whatever I think it he's is. The villain in the Marsupilami movie. Um, I guess I really just know him from The Matrix. But no, there's. But I feel like there's some big French crossover, Babylon there, AD. I'm like, isn't there something pre Matrix, Sahara? I'm just looking at all these sort of like paycheck, timeline, Hollywood villain roles he took. But I'm like, what was the crossover movie I'm forgetting? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, his whole character, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, comes in with an agenda, is trying to take down Benedetta. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got this additional problem with the plague. I mean, the scene early when he's arriving and there's the sort of I am Pagliacci scene where the guy is like, oh, I don't know what to do. And he's like, go talk to your local priest. He's like, I am the local right. priest. Yeah. Well, like, that's so funny, obviously. Great. Yes. Um, but, uh, but, you know, he tries to take her down. He fails. Because she she does her crazy voice, she's much more compelling than him well, in a that, lot of ways. The craziest part of this, which is like Charlotte Rampling goes and is like, "I need you to come fucking check this thing out." R- yeah. While they're gone, she dies. She dies. She straight up dies, and then he shows up, and they're like, "Bad news, she's dead." And he's like, "What the fuck came all this fucking?" Well, not away? not only bad news is she dead, she's dead, but bad news, you're not even allowed to come into the town no, you're the plague, because Benedetta says we're stopping the plague right. and no one's allowed to enter into right. our city. Right. Yes. But it forces so, his way through. Which is another just brilliant example of that sort of double-sided yes. thing where it, it's advantageous to Benedetta that they not come in the town because they won't expose her. Right. But it also... She's her, is she's right on the side. Politically shrewd. Yes. <laughs> she really should not yeah. be letting people in. <laughs> they really right. should close the <laughs> door. The Sound guidance. Yeah. But what? She's been dead for like three days. He comes in. And he's like, okay, let me look at no, the body. Not three days. It was it's the a, afternoon. It, okay. It's a while. And then she's like, <gasps> I'm up, baby. Who's right. this fucker? Right. She's not quite like that. But she's up. She's talking. Right. He tries to. He's <laughs> like, ah, I don't buy it. As you say, of course, she's a political, powerful threat to him mm-hmm. that he recognizes. But there's. That insecurity, which is what I love about this movie that he and Rampling have, where they're like, is Jesus actually talking to her? Like, yes. You know, wait a second. I just read a bunch of books and passed all my tests and sucked the right dicks and paid the right 
Guys, and that's and if, why I'm the nuncio. I didn't realize that Jesus could talk to you. Right, right. We like in theory, our power system is based on biding time until Jesus comes back and then tells us what to do. And the second someone's like, "Hey, just want you know, I got a message from Jesus. Here's what to do." They're like, "Fuck, let's just hold that for one mm, second." I don't want to do that right. though. Wait, you, who who told it's you? Been like 15 years working up the rungs it's of the ladder. A, I mean, not to spoil, but the man is stabbed to death at the end. He's dying. This is it. Yeah, and mm-hmm. she's given him the whole like, "Oh yeah." I've seen heaven. You're Past, in heaven. Present and future, baby. It's covered in plague boils, by the way. We He's, not also. He's not looking good. He's not looking good. Can we and talk about how cool the plague makeup. is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nasty. Did, you get like black bubbles on your body. It feels very like total recall mutant yeah. makeup-y. Like I like how makeup-y it is. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, you know, right, it's right. not realistic. It's stylized, but it's upsetting. Oh, it's gnarly. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Well, and Ben, I know we have to talk about the farting entertainer. We will. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we'll, the we'll, flatulist. We'll I haven't forgotten about him. <laughs> That's like Paul Verhoeven right at the start being like, don't worry. It's okay. Yeah. Fart ben, man is don't good. worry. <laughs> <laughs> there is a man dressed in a skeleton costume. There are three guys there dressed in three skeleton yeah, B-boys yeah. and then but a no, farting yeah. guy. We will, we will devote many but minutes. To me, there's so much pathos and the guy is fucking dying. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, Benedetta, come on. Am I going to heaven? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, well, he's like, I heard you died. And when you died, you crossed over. And she's like, I've seen it all. There's she a says, paradise, past, there's a bad future. place. Right. I get it. I know for a fact. Right. Good place, bad place. And he's still, even his last movie, he's like, full of shit, Jesus. And now I'm dead. Ah! Like, well, it's, know, it's right. such she, a good for He open. looks her in the he eyes and tells to her, the very like, end. where am I going? And she like has the moment where she does the math and goes like paradise. And he's like, you fucking liar. Because yeah. he's like, you may be either you might maybe you know it and you're lying to me or you don't know it but I know where I'm going that's what I love about it the fucking Gordian knot of it is this whole time you've been telling me that you're touched and I think you're a fucking liar and then this moment of vulnerability is I'm about to die I ask you the one question the one thing that can give me solace am I going to heaven and you get the sense that she says paradise to him out of sympathy in that moment Mm -hmm. right and he's like see I knew it all along you're a liar. But by saying that, he's admitting that she knows what the fuck she's talking about. But now she's lying about knowing the real shit to make him feel better. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I love think it. he meant I that you're, you're lying that you know. I interpret it the other way, but I think, once again, this movie is wallowing in that ambiguity yeah. and no one fucking knows. What I was wondering about him, too, hiding his, uh, that he has the plague and that, in fact, all the things that she said is coming true. Right. Yeah, like the motivation, I felt like it was personal more than anything else to him that he just was like, I've got to see this through, even though I have a death sentence and I am bringing this upon all of the other people in this village. Mm -hmm. He's like, fuck Benedetta. I'm going to get her. Right. Which is crazy because I think there's also definitely some gender stuff too going on there that she is has so much power and is wielding it on him. Right, he's supposed to be representing or acting on behalf of some higher power, and it's all so petty and personal for him. Well, it, he, she has power, and she's using it in a way that is different from it, from someone like Charlotte Rampling, which is acceptable power. Yes. She's right. not, yeah. By the book, you're doing the things as our tradition. Right. right. I, I, so here's a question. The, uh, the relationship, the romantic relationship, mm-hmm. the sexual relationship, how much of that is sort of like, a, a Pocahontas esque embellishing or expansion, do we think? Because I mean, David, David read they that. They definitely, you know, they de- well three I know, times but, a week. But but like, how it's much do we know people. about her as a do person? Do we do we know do if we, she literally <laughs> carved a penis out of a Virgin Mary statue? Do we know? No, if there I was don't that think weird entangled relationship outside of just the physical of it. Like we know that she 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 fucked around with this woman. But do we know that much about the woman or the nature of their relationship beyond the physical no, act? No, there, okay. there are not as many records about Bartolomea outside of the testimony okay. in court. Right. And they, I mean, this movie depicts them, they, you know, get this testimony out her, out of her via torture. Yes. Which right. I'm sure is how that went down. The pair of anguish. That which is. Which is a real thing. Brenda. You don't want any of that shit near you. Mm. Uh, um, but, uh, which I'm sure that's how that went down. They were always fucking you know, compelling. Yeah, it's a real, it's one of those, False witness. although it, it, they, the pair of anguish, they've like found examples of it. Like they have like literal versions of it. And then I think historians like 
have made an educated guess as to how it was used. Sure. But there's sure. no actual record. There's no that it was temporary <laughs> first-hand accounts of how to use this. Thing. Right. right. So. The, the Joan of Arc thing, too, where he's yeah. like, you know, Joan of Arc, we all agree Joan of Arc pretty fucking good, right? Pretty good. Pretty good at what she did. Everyone's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, we love her, right? right? Uh-huh. And it's like, she just looked at these fucking devices and she gave in. You don't think you're better than Joan of Arc, do you? But it, once it is again, a good bit of reverse psychology. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm yeah. saying. There's this like cyclical logic to it where it's like, we all agree it was fucked up that we tortured Joan of Arc because now with distance, we all agree she was probably in the right. She was probably in the right. Right. So you don't think you're better than Joan of Arc by pretending <laughs> you are being persecuted yeah. unfairly. 100%. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Uh, okay, the sorry, torture sorry. stuff, the violence, like, and that's like a Verhoeven, right? Like, yeah, just he's, his, like, he's got to put brutal it in there. depiction of violence. Yeah, a lot of CGI blood in this movie, which is interesting to see from him. It has a very different nature to it. I feel like he uses it in a very stylized way, but you can tell as opposed to like Verhoeven previously being a guy who just had fucking gallons and gallons of syrup right. Right. poured everywhere that there's more control in the arcs of these things, you know? It feels more matter of fact like it was kind of in that time. I mean, like life, we just, we, people didn't have the same concept of like this, like the preciousness of life necessarily. No, well, and this is also, this is, this is the thing with Verhoeven. You cannot uh, choose his, his, uh, perspective on the world was was hard earned through a childhood of desensitization to everything. He served in the military, right? But he, was also, he grew up as a child in Nazi occupation. Yeah. He saw death around him and dead bodies as he yeah. like skipped to school and all this fucking shit. And he always tells that story about being inspired by the Bosch painting where there's a guy like pissing in the side and he's mm-hmm. like, that's what I want to make as movies. And this movie <laughs> feels like that where anytime they're walking through the town, there's just so much like shit happening. And no one's really clocking any of it. And when the violence happens, it's like shocking and sort of just it's like everydayness in a certain way, even though it's like. I mean, that's how I felt when I saw Flesh and Blood. Yes. Where Mm -hmm. I had not seen a film that took place in that time period that was so like gross and fucked up. Right. He doesn't sugarcoat. And it like it probably was disgusting back then. Absolutely. Flesh and Blood, which I like, Mm just being a wildly unpleasant movie is pretty much like just that. Whereas yeah. here, I think he's found a really compelling story that he's connected to where he's able to also put in that sort of like world around it. David! What's going on? Look over your shoulder. Okay. Boo! Whoa. It's the holidays, David. They snuck They've up, snuck on, up you. on me. They oh, snuck no. up on you. I thought it was a virtual background of uh, Peter Fonda high-fiving Kurt Russell on a surfboard, but no, it was the holidays. It was the holidays. Uh, Yeah, the season of Gifting Griffiths here, and I'm Mm -hmm. scrambling to find some just right presents for my favorite people. I'm going to be honest with you. No, look, uh, I think all of our uh, senses of time have gotten warped by the last two years, Uh, but uh, you might be panicking, wondering if there's time to give people gifts that actually... uh, matter that will mean something and i'm here to tell you there's still time to get it right this gifting season because brooklyn and has perfect presents for everyone on your list that's right look maybe you're shopping scent for a candle lover maybe you're grabbing a regular old gift card the gift that keeps on giving yes brooklyn and kind of comfort it's always a hit for the holiday look they make award-winning comfort year-round as we know, we talk about them all the time. Beautiful, high quality home essentials that don't break the bank. The perfect place to find a best gift. Mm-hmm. They started with bedding, but they've got it all now, Griffin. All kinds of, you know, essentials, loungewear, decor, slippers. I bought towels from them recently. I bought a hoodie. And they're good, right? They're the towels best. Are good. Comfortable. Their comfort game's unmatched. Their lineup keeps getting better. And if you're looking for more ways to stay cozy, check out Brooklyn Nine's candles, eye masks, and accessories. Take the guesswork out of gifting with comfy crowd pleasers from Brooklyn Nine. We love Brooklyn Nine. I personally, I've just been lighting my Brooklyn Nine candle. That's all. I, I recently got a Brooklyn Nine candle. It's fun. What does it smell like? Sheets? <laughs> Laundry scent. It smells like comfort, I'm sure. It's their nightcap uh, candle. Uh, it's sort of has a bourbon blood orange thing going on, wow. apparently. It's uh, pretty nice. I like a candle these days. I'm pretty boring. Look, I no, like cool. anything. Sorry. I mean, I'm that, cool. Yeah, no, very cool. 
I like anything that Brooklyn in makes. I, I, sometimes I think I don't like something until Brooklyn in does it. You know, I'm like, maybe I'd like eating mushrooms if Brooklyn in made mushrooms, you know? But now I'm like, hold the mushrooms. Look, you can give the gift of comfort this holiday season and save all you do it. Go to brooklynin.com and use promo code blank check for $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's B R O K L I N E N dot com. Enter promo code blank check for $20 off. With a minimum purchase of $100, Brooklyn, brooklynin.com, promo code blank check. Rich and Vicky Bootlamp. We love it. We love them. David. Yep. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. I'm just going to get straight to the point. Absolutely. Great sponsors. It, it, you know, if there's anything interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, uh, like, say, uh, new variants popping up every three months and constantly having to throttle back and forth on how much you're allowed or uh, advisable to live your life, uh, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you'll be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Yeah, it's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. Nope. It's professional therapy done securely online they got a yep. broad range of expertise which might not be locally available in some no. areas no because the uh, service is available for clients worldwide we should mention that it's it's pitbull style it's totally worldwide you can log <laughs> into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist yeah. and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions and you don't have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with as with traditional therapy i was gonna well, now it's it won't the joke won't land as well because you moved on to the waiting room thing. Oh, sorry. Go on. Say the thing about scheduling uh, uh, weekly. You can schedule. Um, I'm sorry. You can schedule a v- weekly video or phone session. Oh, so like DJ Khaled style. Another one. There's always another one. Okay. Well, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. So they can make it, uh, they make it easy and free to change therapists if you need. Yeah. More affordable than traditional offline therapy. Financial aid is available. So Griffin, mm-hmm. but why not start living your a happier life today? Okay. Oh, so you're talking about Ice Cube style. Uh, absolutely. Saying today was a good day. Exactly. Thank you. And so you can visit betterhelp.com slash check. That's better H-E-L-P. And join the over 2 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states. So this is a special offer for Blank Check listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash check. It was a good day. It, it w- I said today was a good day. I know they say that in the song, but it was a good day is the proper title. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's good. It's a good, it's a good, good movie. movie. I think it's, it's a, a very successful movie. film. Yeah. I'm very happy that he made it. I want to see it a second time very badly. I enjoyed watching it a second time knowing, because I definitely the first time was sort of, especially stuff like her dying or whatever. Yeah. I was just like, you know, I kept kind of like freezing in my seat being like, what? Like, you know, like right, there like were a lot of moments. Choice. Yeah. It's not like where I was like, I can't believe it. I was just sort of like, well, that's definitely not what I thought was going to happen. I, I appreciated yeah. the humor the second time around. Mm-hmm. There's a really funny part in this movie where, uh, when Benedetta it becomes the uh, leader of the convent and uh, she is making her first like official request of Charlotte Rampling, who has now been demoted mm-hmm. and uh, a, another nun in the convent is dying and Charlotte Rampling is sitting by her side. But Benedetta is like, um, it's actually going to be my first Vespers today and I want you to be there for it <laughs> because Jesus told me that you should be there for it. And Charlotte Rampling's like, okay, fine. And then Charlotte <laughs> Charlotte Rampling's daughter, Christina, as the aforementioned mean girl in the convent, right. was like, should I be there too? And Benedetta was like, Jesus didn't mention you. But that's what it's, <laughs> it's like so, casting it's so an actor who is more innately modern in that way allows you to sort of like have that commentary without needing to underline it or play right. it deliberately. Same thing. I mean, I feel like this debate was going on of like, is Will Smith too Will Smith to play Richard Williams, right? Like, should it have been a character actor? And I'm like, look, Coleman Domingo could have played that. David Oyelowo could have played that. There are people who could have played that. But part of what you need to make that movie work 
is anytime this guy is saying the shit that sounds insane, you're like, fuck, but he is the most charismatic man I've ever seen. Well, I think there, well, well, I mean, with King Richard, I think another movie that I've seen twice. Um, I think there are ulterior motives for casting someone like Will Smith to play Richard Williams, a guy that was not well liked or respected. Sure, but I'm saying so. It's like, oh, let's have like a famously likable guy play him to as a bit of like reputation management. But I think even beyond that, just in terms of functionality of the movie, and this is not a King Richard episode, but it's like both are interesting <laughs> examples of how you need to cast like a movie star to make a movie right. work versus right, 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 casting right. an actor who can literalize right. the part. Right? Is just like if you have a guy, you watch real interviews with Richard Williams. And the guy is kind of so unpleasant in so many ways, right? That you're like, if you cast someone to play this literally, you as an audience will never buy that he convinces anyone, that anyone takes him up on the offer. The guy has to be somewhat likable in order to believe that he's able to convince anyone to bet on these kids. And it's the same thing with her, where it's like, we as an audience need to be like, I kind of think she might be onto something because she's the person I recognize most in this movie. Her behavior seems the least alien to me despite the fact that she's, like, speaking in tongues and bleeding out of her hands and everything. I don't know. Good movie. Good performance. Good movie. It's, it's a movie filled with ideas, which is not how, I guess, it was originally marketed in a very, like, yeah. salacious way, again, as we it's, spoke it's, it's, about it's earlier. in film market. I'm sure they were just like, oh, he's going to make fucking showgirls with nuns? Right. We know how to sell that. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, yeah. which, which it's, this is the thing. It's like, what's funny about this movie is if you go into it expecting that you'll be like, huh, that's a lot more like sort of disciplined mm-hmm. and, uh, restrained than I imagined. But then if you go into it off of that description, then you're like, this movie's horny as shit. Right. You know? Right. It's, it's like restrained only by Verhoeven standards in terms of your mind's eye, assuming how far it could go. And it certainly doesn't feel like he's doing anything in this movie for shock effect. But I also think that's the weirdness of Verhoeven and why no one is able to replicate him is I don't think he ever consciously is trying to be provocative. I think there's the weird warp area to his mind where he's, I think he's, he thinks a lot of it's funny, but I also think he's just like, I'm the only one willing to say it, you know? I, I think people like who try to make provocative movies. Right. It feels more like, OK, come on. I don't think he. I don't think that provocation was at the forefront of his mind with this movie. No. Which I think is interesting. Yeah, especially considering the 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 danger he was going to find himself in covering anything close to this subject matter. Mm-hmm. That people are just going to be like, fuck you, absolutely not, get out of here, Paul. Well, wasn't that, like, why he didn't end up making his Jesus movie years ago because of what so. happened to Scorsese in The Last yeah. Temptation of Christ? And he's like, hey, I mean, I can handle so much, right. but with something I do really care about, <laughs> like, my life's work as I, a scholar of Christ, I, he's also like, I don't want to get This is never going to get a fucking fair shake. There's going to be a controversy that overwhelms whatever I'm trying to do with this movie. Right. People are not going to meet this halfway. Yeah. Nobody makes more movies. What's what's the the one line on the new Meyer movie that just got announced this week? I'll look it up. I, I remember it does. It sounded fairly compelling. Right. And then the thing like six months ago was you said, I'm like developing two movies. I'm developing a script with Newmeyer. And then there's like a Hollywood thriller I'm considering. It's called Young Sinner, the cool. Newmeyer movie. Yeah. And he says, oh, it uh, takes place in D.C. a political thriller set in Washington, D.C. Our heroine, a young staffer who works for a powerful senator, is drawn into a web of intrigue and danger. And of course, there is also a little sex. <laughs> There's also a little sex. Of course. Um, and then he... Okay. Yeah, that, that's what he said. I don't, okay. I don't know about the other thing. That, this is the one thing I know about. But uh, yeah. I'd love him to make it. Someone give him money. Please. I just I want to bring him back to America. I think he Me is too. one of our greatest critics of American culture. Right. He needs to make at least one last. It's good last. for him to be on the inside. Yeah. Right. yeah. I think he has to make a studio system movie and I'll even count like a Netflix movie or whatever. If that's what it takes. It takes him going to Hulu. I'll, <laughs> I'll suck it down. I just want him taking money from like an American corporation again and going like, thank you very much. I mean, it's just, sneaking it's, away and doing his It's so funny Do you watching know what this movie like, is about? the you opening credits of Benedetta and seeing like 10 different production companies. Yeah. 
I mean, he's just taking like I know. 10 cents from like I know. <laughs> 20 different people. Right, which is why you're like, the, he just put a nipple poster out there yeah. at the American film market, which, which people haven't been, is like the basement underneath Khan, and it's just the seediest shit in the world. Yeah, I mean, like, the seediest thing of Khan is like the yacht parties. Well, okay. Then it's the American film market. Correct. The layers of Connor. <laughs> Maybe you should make a movie about the Con Film Festival. Ugh. All right. So uh, if we're going to, I guess, maybe be done with talking about the movie, there really is only one thing I think that the really needs to be addressed, which is that go right ahead. when we first arrive <laughs> to the village. Uh-huh. Yep. Into uh, what's the town called again? Pescia. 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 Yeah. Pescia town. Yeah. You kind of get a sense of what's going on in the town square. I wish people could see Ben's body language. There is a performance happening. Okay. There is. There is a gentleman with a. He's holding like a flaming torch. torch. He's got a torch. Mm -hmm. A lit torch. Right. And with him are bone men, basically. Three men dressed as skeletons. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And they're seeming. Mikey Day, Bobby Moynihan. (laughs) They're seeming to kind of come up and, and to attack him, if you will. Uh huh. Well, what does he do to defend himself? He turns the torch around and he produces a fart, thereby making the flame bigger. They run away in fear. So this is one of my father's favorite references when I was growing up around the house. There was the man named Lapita Main, which Mel Brooks takes the character name for the mayor he plays in um, uh, Blazing Saddles. Say, say the name again? I believe his character, I, I believe that the man's name was Lapita Main. I might be mispronouncing yeah, that. No, you're right. He was yeah, a, a, a famous professional French flatulist. How do you spell that? Around the start of the 20th century is L E, then P E T O M A. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. So he was like the star flatulist of the beginning of a recorded era, you know, where you were able to photograph. He, like, you know, recorded it on a gramophone. Yes. Or like he was like, oh, they're recording sounds now. I got a sound. For it was it. a hit. Fucking a hit greatest swing. hits, man. Right. Etch this shit into a record. Dang. It, My point here is just I was raised in a, I a feel household. Bad for the guy who recorded that. Because, <laughs> you know, he's farting. Yeah. He, maybe microphone. that guy was in another booth. I, I you hope so. <laughs> Why do you think they started the building soundproof exactly. booths for recording? It wasn't about the sound leaking out, it was about like the, the smell. They were like, like, oh, the padding is for the um That's what's the not, noise. That's yeah. what's not in get back. It's yes. like 80. Actually, I think they do rip some farts and get back. Ringo farts. Yeah, Ringo get farts. Back. They should have like a wet hot yeah. style fart track on <laughs> get back. Um my my point here is that I grew up in a household. My father, it was very important. Religion was not important in our household. What was important was that my father made sure that my my siblings and I knew that uh, farting uh, is a profession, that it has been held as a profession and celebrated within the arts. Did you not know before this scene that such a thing as a flatulist existed? I 100% knew. Okay. I feel like I've known that my whole life okay. for some reason. Yeah. You just didn't expect it to show up in this movie. I did not. And yeah. I was really fucking excited. Yeah. And here's the thing. It made yeah. me think. Like, yeah. how, one like, more thing. <laughs> like entertainment. Sure. How if we moved away from that? You're yeah. saying like, like bring it back. Taking improv classes. Fuck. There we're should good. just be a class <laughs> where you're the guy people. who's like, how to fucking <laughs> fart like yeah. on cue. That yeah. shit is I funny. Mean, everyone's sitting at the UCB training center. Guy comes in with eight torches. He's like, everyone take a torch. <laughs> All right. All right. Now light them up when I tell you. No, like, listen, that's, that is like, almost, I'm almost like, is that ben, where comedy peaked? Ben, kind of. can I tell oh. you about an entertainer who lived in 12th century England? Please. He went by the name Roland the Farter. <laughs> <laughs> his, I like his style. Amusingly, yeah. his given name was George, but I guess he thought Roland just really worked with farting. Uh, he was given... Uh-huh. A manor in Suffolk and 12 acres of land in return for his services as a jester to King Henry II. Etch, every year, he was obligated to perform Unum Saltum et Stifilum et Unum Bumblum, which means one jump, one whistle, and one fart for the king's <laughs> court at Christmas. This is the thing. These people used to be celebrated. They used to be held up as pillars of our community and of our culture. This guy like the fucking, you know, tax books right. <laughs> or whatever. Dude, like, fart joke is shorthand for hacky comedy, right? And people are like, look, I'm not going to put fucking fart jokes in my thing. And it's like, these people used to be thought of as artists. Like, I see the shit and I'm like, look what they took from it. Exactly. Uh, um, in our blank check text thread, mm-hmm. Ben did send us the Wikipedia for Flatulist. Mm-hmm. 
He did. Um, That's how I found Roland yeah, the Fargo. It's, it, apparently, St. Augustine in City of God mentions some performers who did have, quote, such command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will. Yeah, it seems so as like to produce the effect of singing. Lapita, Dom Deloise. This is the thing with Lapita Man. It seems like he could almost draw air in and then shoot it well, out. He was the best there ever was. It's saying. not he was the Michael Jordan of farting. It's not even fair. Yes. I think Lapita Man had incredible control. <laughs> Um, also noted here, uh, Terrence and Philip are noted yes. on the uh, well, flat Well, of course. <laughs> well, but of course. I I don't know. I think a biopic is like the move for yeah. a flatulist. See, why do I feel like Lapita Main? You know? I feel Lapita like Lapita someone was sure. trying to make a Lapita Main movie. Ma- for a while. Michelle, I feel like, like Galvanakis. No, but I feel like you know? this is why like, my father would always <laughs> talk about. It. Wait, sorry, Griffin. I know that you're French, but did yeah. you know that Lapita Main comes uh, combines uh, the French verb pete? To fart with men, maniac. Suffix. <laughs> this guy's the farting maniac. Farto maniac. I'm just is imagining the literal translation. Like King Henry at his fucking Christmas dinner, and like some vassal is like, "My lord, you are so good." He's like, "Uh huh, uh huh." He's like, "Is is Roland the farter here yet? <laughs> like, when is when are we when are we getting that? <laughs> is that after dessert or before? I just want to know. I just want to know when I'm getting it. He's looking forward to it. <laughs> it's a great performance. And like, if he's like. doing one fart a year, is he like? In training for months, like eating all kinds of Is he beans. trying to develop new <laughs> farts? Yeah, right. Like, right. Wait, there was an, an Italian film in 1983 called Il Petomani, starring Ugo Tonazzi. All right, well, I'll report back on that. Yeah, yeah you, you check should that watch out. that. Really? We should yeah, play the box office battle. game. Yeah, we should play the box office game. Thank you for um, uh, uh, allowing me to. Uh, to just go off on that tangent. Of course. That was he also, I'm sorry, he also apparently appears as a character in Moulin Rouge. I forgot about that. Oh. Lapita Maine? Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, you know, it's all yeah. going okay. off then, right? There, there is a modern day flatulist. Mr. Methane. Mr. Methane. Birth name Paul Oldfield. Mm. He started performing in 1991, briefly retired in 2006, restarted mid-2007. He claims to be the only performing farter in the world today. He worked on the railways. Before focusing on his flatulence performances. Oh, okay. He wasn't farting on the railways. He was doing oh, railroad, oh, railroad work. Uh, this website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it not good? Oh, oh boy. Wow. Does it have sort of angel fire vibes? Absolutely. Or, right. Huge angel so, fire vibes. Um, oh, this guy's kind of got like a Riddler look. He has an album. He auditioned for British. Okay. Britain's Got Talent. Should I buy a fart in a jar right now? Uh, you can buy a fart in a Maybe. jar. He has a DVD uh, called Open Mr. It. Your oh my God. Mr. Methane Let's Rip. Let's also say... He, he's dressed like a superhero. Yeah. In 2004... See, I, Man has class. Like He's wearing... He's finest. wearing a tuxedo. Yes, and he's holding the one finger up. Like He looks like a fucking conductor. Yeah. Uh, he will also make a short video of your ceremonial guffawing ritual... Guffing ritual is I fill your jar with pure Mr. Methane ass gas. I see. I don't like how goofy this guy is. You, yeah. you, you think he should be he should be coming in in like a cape, uh, but I like think a black be cape, classy, like a, like a tuxedo, classy. In uh, July 2014, saw Mr. Methane release a fart app for Android devices. The app had originally been developed in 2010 for the iPhone, but was rejected by Apple. Yeah. See, I, this guy is. He is <sighs> Like, I, I don't mean to be rude about the Brits, but like. Is this like the sort of like weird panto shit that you guys all like? Yeah. I don't. It doesn't translate over yeah, here. It doesn't. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Box cut office. the video. Cut the, get, get Mr. Methane out of here. He's bumming me out. <laughs> I can't. Ben's into it. Wait, Ben's one over. Hold on. Wait. <laughs> he has a all right a uh, shit eating grin on his face right now. He's more. red. He's his face is red. Let's also mention he's <laughs> he's so happy. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Wait, um, this box office game is interesting. I truly have no idea what's number one. We're essentially talking about last weekend. At yeah. The box right. office, December third, twenty twenty one. And as we're saying, this a light weekend because it's sort of a post Thanksgiving weekend. Right. I think as the specialty box office has struggled, uh, IFC's plans for Bandetta have have shifted back and forth many times over the last couple of months. I think they ended up putting this on more screens than they two hundred and one screens, and they're also holding it there for a little longer than originally intended. So this might end up making a little bit of a scroll. Yeah. There were only like three people at my screening. I will say I had a decent crowd last night at a 6 p.m. Times Square uh, Thursday night. How many teens were there to make out? None. No making out teens? I didn't see any at the very least. It felt like a very respectful art house crowd. 
How many wow. nuns would you say there like were? Four, five. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, how many little brown packages wrapped in string? That's the sound of music reference. Okay. What? Number one what at the box office. The bobbins? Yeah, the bobbins. That's, that's a wild a weird scene. scene. Yeah. Where Benedetta is kind of really nasty. To see, that's, but that's also like, I was watching it. I was like, this is everything I expected out of a Verhoeven lesbian nunsploitation movie where that feels like a weird, like early showgirls well, negging scene. Right? That, that plus uh, when Christina is forced to whip herself. Yeah. yeah man. And then Benedetta and Bartolome are both like turned on by it afterwards. Yeah. I was like, ooh, um, that was pretty Verhoeven. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Those mm. bobbins. Just let him boil. Who cares? Fucking care. Get a slotted spoon. I don't know. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No. <laughs> Number one at the box office. Okay. Griffin is an animated film. Number Ooh, one at the box. office. I know what it is. I know what it is. It's uh, Encanto. 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 I haven't seen it. Has, I, has anyone? I hear, yeah, it's out yeah. in the world. No, but have you seen it, Griffin? I have seen it. Okay, I, Jesus. I'm gonna. You don't have to be ooh. so fucking uh, like uh, dodgy about it. No, here's my thing. I think I saw it maybe the day it came out. Uh-huh. Um, I've I've been uh working on a voiceover job that I still cannot talk about, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And I had like a very long, intensive voiceover session for this thing mm-hmm. uh, and have not been sleeping well and was just mainlining caffeine to keep my energy up to do the fucking silly cartoon voices right for like hours on end so like drank a bunch and then kept on being like can I get more caffeinated tea more caffeinated tea so then I get out of this like session and it's like 6 7 p.m. and I was like I have like too much energy in my body and I don't know how to come down right let me like have myself a little dinner glass of wine whatever and I was like I still feel too amped up so I was like trying to get home with like all this adrenaline rushing through my body. And like, I'm going to fucking tell this story. And I'm like in Times Square getting ready to like get on a train to go home. And suddenly I need to shit worse than I ever have in my entire life. Been there. Right. And I'm like, like I, I maybe have two minutes. Mm-hmm. Right. I was just like up against the clock and I was like, Starbucks, look, this, there, where's their fucking public restroom that I can physically get to in time? And I like looked and I was like, my only solution is I have to I have to buy a ticket to go see a movie. I've done it. So you saw Encanto because you had to shit. Right. So I like go upstairs and have the worst shit of my life. <laughs> and then <laughs> I the just... AMC 20, 40, 42nd Street or? 14th Street. 14th Square. Oh, shoot. Sure, sure. Right. I just Regal had this Union like wow. destructive shit. I'm like, what starts in 30 minutes? Right. That right. was the first thing. I was like, I don't really feel like seeing this right now. I've just... So spent we'll the day see doing how cartoon voices after this. Right, right but it's yeah. like I pay fucking $18. I'm like tapping the button. I'm holding my butt. I'm like running upstairs. I get there. Horrible shit. Clean up the damage. And then I'm just sitting there and I'm like, now I gotta watch Encanto. You don't gotta. I mean, I felt like it, I would I feel understand. sillier if I didn't watch it. Okay. But so it's like that just happened and I'm like crashing from caffeine. Uh-huh. And the movie started and I was like, I can't handle this. This is stressing me out. The movie is like very loud and very bright and sure. like very energetic. How dare it? A children's film <laughs> from Disney I, about I life it, in uh, Colombia or whatever. Right, which I don't hold this against it, but it's like more manic than most recent Disney. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's, it's Lin Manuel, right? He yeah. wrote the music. Byron Howard, the uh, Zootopia, mm-hmm. one of the Zootopia directors, is, is yeah. the director. I like Zootopia. It's, it's an odd film and I was watching it and I was like I think this doesn't work at all and then I read some reviews by friends of ours people who really like Bilga's well, Bilga is particular. a huge fan of it right and I was like reading and I was I like, the it. movie they're just describing sounds interesting to me I maybe need to give this another shake the thing he pointed out about it which I agree with and I'm only going into this because someone on a reddit thread was like does Griffin hate this movie because yeah. I haven't had to talk about yeah. it yet um, I just I feel like I, I don't really have a fair opinion of it yet mm. the thing I found really fascinating about it and Bilga called this out but almost as a um, a, a positive quality of it I don't know yet is it like really feels like a stage bound musical hmm. the show hmm. the show I call it a fucking show the movie almost never leaves the fucking house like the whole thing takes place in the house they never maybe go like two That's blocks sort of interesting. outside of the house are they ghosts no and it's like there's so many characters in a way that like in movies you're not used to but in a Broadway show you're like here's the ensemble and we name this person once and they have a costume and you never really need to develop them and the whole thing kind of takes place in proscenium. The songs are pretty much sung straight to camera. Every character has a solo number that we're like, here I am and here's my deal. And then they like disappear, you know, or they just go back into the ensemble. And it feels like it has like an act one that's just like world building. And the stuff in the house feels like it would be like 
incredible stagecraft. Mm -hmm. And then in act two where you're like, oh, this is what it's about. But the whole first act, it's just kind of, I, I don't know. It's, it's very odd. It's narratively odd. Bilga made the argument that everything I think is odd about it is actually pretty interesting and daring, which I'm willing to accept. But watching it, it did not go down easily for me. It's a movie in which I, I say currently, no opinion, non-applicable, non-complete. N.A. Yeah. Okay. TBD. Haven't seen Encanto. Ben, you saw it? No. Okay. Feels fine. like Disney Marie? dumped it. No. It's doing okay, but it's also going on Disney Plus in 30 days. It'll well, be on by is, Christmas. They they decided not to Disney Plus it in, in for like their sort of weird, mysterious approach to 2021 right. where they're like, this one is, and this one isn't, this one right. is, and this one is. Everything's isn't. a trial balloon. They put it out at Thanksgiving, which is normal, but then they didn't really give it a lot no. of juice. I just, no. I just felt like they, because like they, I got invited to like one screening. Like, yeah. I don't know. They were just not it really. Doesn't, it just, not are they marketing up, it to children? I don't, I don't think so. Because sometimes like, I feel like child. I don't see any marketing for something. Yeah. But then I'm like, done, oh, I'm not the target it audience. It's done fine. I yeah. mean, it's made a fair amount of money. Honestly, it's made $60 million. What What do you think? So we brought up Disney Plus. I'll make this quick. I just, I take back what I said about the Beatles. Whoa! You watched it. Pretty damn good. They're pretty favorite movie. My favorite cool. movie of 2021, wow. even though David yeah, says it's not a movie. No, it's a TV show or whatever. It doesn't yeah. matter. Rules. It's still rules. It kind of, I got really into it. Yeah, man. Yeah. They're pretty incredible. They're pretty band. Ben energy, honestly. They're a bunch of who's, crunchy who's chillers. Your, who's your guy? Oh, come on. I can't. That's tough. I don't know. You got to have going one. from fuck the Beatles to how could I pick I a favorite? I love them all. <laughs> fuck. That's what your parents I feel like I feel to. like Ringo would be your favorite. I, I do say. think Ben has a bit of a Ringo. Uh, but I also energy, think but... that as a producer, Paul is the producer character. <laughs> but I also think in temper, like I think Ringo is the one that Ben would find the most amusing. But I'm like George would probably be the one he liked the most as a guy. I, I, I think, think so. Kind of yeah. has John's sense of humor sometimes. I don't know. Is man. it like Sex in the City where like everyone has a bit yeah. of Samantha right, Carey? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think it is. And it's like four either, voices you know? inside your head. Yeah. Um, also, Carrie Bradshaw has a podcast. Yes, she Yeah, she, she invented Everybody's it. getting into Everyone's it. Everyone's getting into it. Um, I like Encanto more than I liked Raya, which I think I did not like, and I need to give Encanto a second strike. I will say it is interesting to me, having done uh, uh, Musker and Clements earlier this year, who now are apparently out of retirement, ready to make a very, very different animated movie that's very exciting to me. Uh, there should be more fucking, like, superhero adaptations in different mediums and different sure. styles rather than these fucking canonical interconnected universe shit. But I was going to say, it is interesting to me, and Canto was the time where I'm like, man, for how much this new era of CGI Disney princess musicals was like, we're fucking modernizing these things. We're doing away with tradition. They have really boiled it down to a formula now where mm -hmm. the structure of these movies are like, the opening scene is always the main character is a little girl and an elderly relative tells him the family history, uh, explains the entire I'm thing, bored. and then it ages up and they're sort of like, I, don't know, I love they everything, but maybe it's a show because maybe I'm actually frustrated about the life convent, I want to live. Then they enter a convent, they start having visions of Jesus. And they like they none of them have <laughs> love interests anymore and they all have weird villains who like aren't really villains. Right, and the sort twist of is who the villain is. Right. right. But, then, but then ultimately it's like they weren't bad, they were just sort of misinformed and they understand... I, I, that all kind of got to me a little bit, which it's like, it just feels like we're it's maybe designing at, it too. Like, There's nothing wrong with that. 1999 yeah. in the Disney renaissance of the 90s where it's like, okay, fuck it, we get it. Come on. Gotcha. Time to revitalize this. How, how would you rank the Disney animated releases of this year? What's the other one? There's Luca. three, aren't there? Luca. I love Luca. I love Luca. I love Luca. I've watched Luca twice now and it really grew for me the second time. They I sent also, me a Luca Blue. Luca. Oh, I got a Luca Steelbook, my friend. Hmm. Um, I think that movie is uh, wonderful and I like how modest it is. I yeah. like the ambition to be like, we don't have to fucking make some profound existential, it's going to destroy you emotionally thing. It, it does feel like a, a Studio Ghibli movie yeah. in that way where it's just like, what's well, just a small story, a story well told. Yeah. Uh, Luca rolls. Okay. Number two at the box office is. Go on. It's not House of Gucci, is it? No, House of Gucci is number three. It dropped. It Although did. it is far and away the highest grossing drama of 2021. Yeah, it's making, you know, some money. Um, After one weekend, it had outgrossed all other dramas released this year. Look, it's been a weird year. Yep. Going to be honest with you. Um, um, number two House of Gucci is number three, but number two is... New release? Or we saw it whole? together. We saw it together. It's not a new release. The only new release is number four. 
what's what's the thing that we saw together recently? Um, give me genre, please. Uh, it's a sequel, action, sci-fi, children's adventure. <laughs> you know all that shit. Ah, uh, it sounds like uh, every. Uh, what did we movie. see together? This is why I'm. I was grumpy. Oh, oh, oh. How telling is it that I've already blocked this from my memory? Mm-hmm. It's Ghostbusters Afterlife. Ghostbusters oh, Afterlife. It's Ghostbusters wow. Afterlife. I forgot that was the movie. I know. I was it's so made angry about it for two weeks, and now I've just forced it into a memory hole. Ghostbusters Afterlife. We, look, we were debating we before the movie. I was like, I think this thing was going to be a depressingly big hit. And you were like, I don't. I think it's going to land limp. And then after the movie, I was like, you might be right. It might crawl to 100. It's, it's a hit by whatever current standards of box office success we have, which are obviously graded on a curve, the thing is working. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. It's working by 2021 standards. It's done well, making $100 million. By other standards, it's done pretty badly, I guess. But I think they're happy. I think everyone's happy. It cost half as much as Ghostbusters 2016 and will probably end up at the exact same numbers. Number five, four, number four, three is Gucci. Number four. Is Gucci's eight, up to 30. 36 at this point, I think. Um, number four is... In this broken year. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a faith film. Oh, oh, it has a, a sort of surprise title, right? It does. It's called... Is like, it the Kurt the, Warner movie? No, it's not. No. The, it, this is called like... There's the, another one? The it's, blank colon blank for blank or something? It's not that crazy, but it, it's people basically seeing Christmas films from the set of a movie uh, called The Chosen. Isn't there a subtitle to it? There is. So the film is called The Chosen. Uh, I guess that's like a faith movie. Or no, wait. I don't fucking know. Look, the movie's called Christmas with the Chosen, colon, The Messengers. Christmas with the Chosen, colon, The Messengers? Thank you. And David said the title's not that crazy. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, it's pretty crazy. Uh, I don't understand how those words relate to each other. Like, I don't either. Artists uh, perform uh, new and classic Christmas songs from the set of something called The Chosen. So it's a concert film on the set of a Christian movie, right? Which I don't think that The Chosen's a TV show. I don't know. There's 17 episodes of The Chosen, which seems like it ended three years ago. No. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but it was the number four movie. Christmas in with The Chosen. Uh, Christmas with the Chosen. Okay, the Chosen was a TV show about Jesus. It was the first multi-season series about the life of Jesus, and of course, is this the thing that Roma Downey and the dude who the other her the producer that she's married to who did Survivor did? No, oh, look at me. I have What's no his idea. name? This, He's like um, an Australian guy. It's Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett. Yeah, right. is it the Mark Burnett thing? No, this is a guy named Dallas Jenkins. Who crowd sounds like a fake name funded this? He was oh the most God. successful media crowdfund of all time. He's some bootstrappy. His father wrote the Left Behind books. Oh, okay. So and then a lot he of started a, a Christian production company. They've been making films. They've had a good number of films. They did a movie called Resurrection of Gavin Stone, which was WWE's faith based film. So he's had a couple of these faith based movies that broke out a little bit. Then he self produced through GoFundMe or whatever, a two-season Jesus TV show, the second season of which came out this year. And then this is a special shot on those sets with people singing the songs. Yeah. It's uh, made $10 million. That's insane. And the chosen 11, the TV sorry. show, of course, is streaming on VidAngel, <coughs> which is an American streaming video company that allows the user to skip what may be considered distasteful content. That sounds great. Isn't it kind of insane that like... Some of the best art that's ever existed in the world is like Catholic art, mm-hmm. but like there's never been any good Christian art. It's an interesting question. An interesting I question. think there's been good Christian art, but there are, there's what? a lot of bad what? Christian art. Like I American know. evangelical Christian art. I know what you're talking about. That's there has been be no good bad. Christian right. art. Yes. If Vin Angel's one of these companies that got sued by all the major studios where they're like, you're recutting our movies. Right. Um, you can't actually just cut out all the swears and put it on right. your platform. So right. now it seems like they've shifted to making their own 
content. That's how it always goes, baby. Everyone making content now. They had to pay $10 million in damages to different studios for editing their things. Yeah. A big part of their uh, original content is they did uh, 52 comedy specials mm -hmm. as part of a lineup called Dry Bar Comedy. Yeah, I, I actually wrote those. Um, number five at the box office. Okay. I'm moving us off of this bullshit. Is a Marvel film. Uh, it is uh, Eternals. It's Eternals, which is made quietly, four hundred million dollars worldwide. Even yeah. though everyone was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of a wet fart, right? If a movie. Yeah, I really liked it. Yeah, David I don't know I what to tell it. you. Oh, you did? Yeah. Dave and I like it. We think I also like wrong. movies about weird sad robots who don't know what to do with themselves. Neither of you have seen it, right? <laughs> no, I don't. I Marie don't doesn't care. really go into I know. that kind yeah. of stuff. Look, I, was, I was so ready to be uh, indifferent, and I think that movie's really interesting. I think it's a mess. The thing I equated it, I mean, we were texting about it afterwards, and I was like, I think it's a shittier version of The Old Guard. I think The Old Guard accomplishes sure. everything I find interesting about that movie, by and large, in a I, far I generally more agree with that too. way, yeah. except for the one big thing the movie does that I think could only be done, like 25 films into a Marvel Cinematic Universe that I think is pretty interesting. The thing I equate it to for you was like Tomorrowland, where I'm like, this movie is objectively a fucking mess. But just, it has ideas in it that I think are so bizarre, and the confidence in which it thinks it's going to get a mainstream audience to accept these ideas is hard for me not to be a little one over. I just think it's so cool. Some dude I was on a set with recently so was like trying to explain how the movie was like one big abortion metaphor. Mm. And sure I'm like, sure that's I'm like, not true. I yeah. don't. I'm just not, I don't. not picking up that vibe. I just think it's hilarious that Marvel released a film this year that was sort of like you know a lesser known property. So kind of, that's kind of exciting. Like it's not you know Thor mm -hmm. four, right? Right. It's from the holder of the current a Best Picture yes. Best Director yes. trophies, and Marvel's like, check it out. And everyone was like, oh, lame. And like threw fruit. Not like that. Not only is it. That's not the grand arbiter of our culture, but it is. This is the set I find astounding. The first rotten Marvel movie in terms of Rotten Tomatoes ever. And you think about how many fucking wet fart movies they've released and all of them just got like, ah, I don't know. This one isn't great. 80% fresh. And this is the first one where people are like, fuck this. Well, it's because they set our expectations higher. Sure. Yes, that yes. was part of it. I think that's part of, part of it. I think yeah. people got their knives out for because they were like, "How dare you try to well, actually what are they make something supposed legitimate?" To do? Be like, "Yeah, Chloe Zhao made a movie for us. Check it out." You know, like of course they're gonna I just lay think, on the mustard. I think so many of the critics who style themselves as Marvel haters, you actually look at their Marvel reviews and they give most of those films like I don't know seven out of ten. Right. I and mean, then this one, it's like for all of its failings, it is trying to actually respond to criticisms in some way and go like. You're right. Maybe we need to fucking loosen up yeah. this Marvel shit and try other stuff. And people were like, how fucking dare you? I'll watch it when it's on Disney+. Plus. When we finish recording, I'm going to tell you the thing I think is interesting about okay. this movie that I don't want to ruin for people. But I, I think, David, you and I had both been like, we never need to do Marvel commentaries ever again. And then watching this, we were like, maybe we need to do this phase when it's done. Because I'm very interested to see how they react to the negative response to this movie. Well, yes. I think going forward, it will be... What phase are we going into? Four, I believe we're currently. I mean, I in. don't. I, I, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I think I I've can... seen fewer than ten Marvel movies. Hey, period. This is really it's not still my a lot thing. of movies when I you know. think. About I know, it. right? Yeah. Which is it speaks to yeah. some of the other films in the top ten. Mm -hmm. Number six, Resident Evil: Welcome to Raccoon City, a film that I want to see, but I'm just kind of like, and like I'm a film critic, right? And I'm kind of like, I can wait for that to that, be on and fucking that's, whatever. That's a failure. That's a failing if they can't get you excited enough. It's because all the reviews I read were like, it's very faithful to the video games. It's a little lifeless, but it's like pretty entertaining. And I'm Are like, jo Jovovich and Anderson. No, no, no. Involved? It's like a total reboot. Oh, then, yeah. And I mean, so I'm just kind of like, eh. You know what's but interesting? But I'll watch the it. The thing it reminds me of is the fucking David Harbour Hellboy movie where it's like, we gave some weird stylist the chance to adapt this thing and they sort of turned it half into their own thing, half into the original thing. And now we're rebooting it and we're making it just the way the source material was. And in theory, that should be like catnip. And everyone's like, I don't know, fucking cares. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Um, we're just yeah. making the literal video game movie. People are like, I mean, I'll watch it. I like the video games, but yeah. I'm just not, not ruining my engine. Number seven, Twilight the Big Red Dog. A movie I saw that is quietly insane. Yeah, sure. Well, well, know. yeah. The dog is huge and he's red. Well, well, Becker there, are so many things. there are so many classic Beckerisms in this movie because. Like, Alvin 4, uh, The Road Ship, 
I went to see hoping there'd be a little bit of that old dog's chaos. And it's like, it's not really there outside of the John Waters cameo. This has the thing where every scene, five things are said that make zero sense and are over-explained. And the way the logic stacks on top of each other is demented. It's no old dogs, but it, it fits into the oeuvre. Uh, eight is uh, Dune, just sort of quietly still making money, even though you can literally buy it on the internet now. Mm-hmm. Uh, nine is King Richard quietly not making money. Yeah, that's a, that's. I mean, I get why because of the whole HBO Max Look, thing. But that's a that is a crowd pleaser. The yeah. HBO Max thing is crippling. Yeah, obviously, like, yeah. that's the worst decision Warner Brothers ever made. But although they might be like, what do you mean HBO Max? Um, but uh, it is a little long. It's a it's yeah, a it smidge is. long. It's like it's two like and a half hours, twenty right? almost, or like. Yeah. That thing could benefit from, you know, just, know, just a little bit of compression. The bonus act where it sort of becomes... I, and I like the bonus right, act. Yeah. So I'm not like completely... But I do wonder, you know, it just... I don't know. It's just a little flat. Maybe... maybe um, the, but whatever. Yeah. Two hours, 24 minutes. I know. It's good, Pretty though. Long. It's good. It's very fucking watchable. I mean, it's Marie so watched it twice. I'm sure I watched it, watched it twice. Yeah. Watched it first alone. Uh, second yeah. time with my dad. And then, I'll my say, dad told me... Yeah that he tried to King Richard me as an opera singer as a child and he failed. That's fine. He tried to baby Annette you more yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Marie's baby Annette costume was out of control. It was so fucking Thank good. you, Griffin. Um, it was. With and the then, drones flying around. Uh, number yeah. 10 of the box office, I just want to ask you, the second most successful film of the year? The second most successful film of the year Is it be, Venom 2? No, Time to Die or Venom 2? Venom 2. Okay. I think worldwide, no time to die, but uh, yeah, I mean, domestically, it's Venom 2. Right. Worldwide, it's no time to die. Domestically, it's Shang-Chi. Right. Right. And then, yeah. Yep. Uh, Venom 2, huge, huge, uh, people uh, big were like, hit. Ben- Venom's back. Yeah. I- I'll, one ticket, please. Must see. Yep, like, I went. must fucking see. I, went, I hung out we with my, my good friend. Uh-huh. And how would it go? It was great. And yep. I look forward to seeing him again soon. You will. I, think- I know. <laughs> did, you, did you guys see that article that was kind of going around about? how uh, sound mixing in movies has gotten more muddled. I did. And one of the reasons they gave was literally Tom Hardy. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Like, yeah, that rules. <laughs> that uh, he constantly makes decisions to mumble his words and everyone everyone loves it. Can I just say a thing about King Richard? <laughs> yeah. Did you mumble it though? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you think about King Richard. Can I say something to you about King Richard? Yeah, That's my exactly. burnt ball. This house is not well built. Uh, yeah, I don't know. King Richard. Best supporting actor, John Bernthal <laughs> and King Richard. Uh, he's so fucking he's good. He's so good. Um, I feel like Warner Brothers is not even pretending that that movie has done well on HBO Max. Like, they're kind of admitting, like, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it yeah. definitely didn't live up to expectations. They're bad at the Netflix thing of, like, yeah, so, you know they they tried it at first, but now they're just kind of like it was also an HBO Max. Now this is what I found interesting as a comparison point. After the first week or weekend, whatever it was, a Power of the Dog, Netflix was like, "Huh, this was watched by one million people," right. which I believe made it- as a number because it's not seventy million in twenty four hours. Right. Whenever they lie about numbers, right. it's always in the same sphere, and it felt like they were genuinely just kind of like, "Huh, this did better than we thought it would." And King Richard did worse than you thought it would. Has, has HBO Max ever released viewing they, stats? They did it a couple times. Not maybe, couple but times. like they've done a couple sort of like most watched thing ever on HBO Max for some I of I feel these. like Mortal Kombat, they released numbers and Mortal Kombat have. was the one where they were like, this was watched by many more people at home than in theaters. Mm-hmm. Like it was disproportionate. It was and that movie by, I'm seeing this, here. Yeah, it probably logged about a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm seeing, pointing to I'm seeing a radiating hot zone in northern Brooklyn. What's going on here? <laughs> but I feel like a lot of them, the they're servers like, are overloaded. Yeah. There. They're like, Dune did well in theaters, also did well at home. Like, they've mostly been proportionate, right? And when people, like, when in the Heights bombed and they were like, well, it's just because everyone stayed home to watch it, they were like, no, they're pretty much even. Like, it's right. like high it just, tide it races. underperformed everywhere. Both ships. Right. I do think there's this thing, and it's different with Netflix because people just fucking have Netflix as their homepage or their default app on their TV, and they check it, and they see what the new thing is, and they sample it or whatever. That, like, the destructive element of King Richard in particular being on HBO Max as opposed to maybe A Many Saints of Newark, which people are into because it's a TV it's show that they're already watching on that app or a Dune or a Space Jam, where it's like, I don't know, whatever, I'll fucking give this a shot, right? Is that, like, I think people didn't go to see it in theaters mm. and simultaneously were like, oh, right, it's on HBO Max. I'll watch that at some point. Right? Like, there's, there's not a, it's not a Friday night fire it up kind of thing, felt not like, like there Dune was or whatever. no need to see excitement versus Power of the Dog, where I'm just like, 
that movie feels a lot less accessible. That movie's getting like memed, you know? Well, like, yeah, which I thing. don't understand. Bronco I mean, Henry. I understand. Bronco Henry. Br- I mean, Bro- Bronco it's, Henry is one of the greatest character names in history. It's the same <laughs> fucking thing that happened with uh, Marriage Story, where I was just like, yeah. I, I remember going to my Even comic Irishman, book store. Even Irishman, you know, solidarity! Well, yes. yeah. you know, like, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I remember going to my comic book store, my local comic book store, when Irishman came out, and all the employees, like, uh, not Irishman, Marriage Story, all the employees were talking about Marriage Story. And they were like, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't usually, like, watch I'm movies I'm with Scott like Joe. This. I don't know. What about you? Who are you no, siding they were, with? Like, sort of saying, you know, like, you know it's what? pretty good. I don't usually watch movies like this, but, like, it's on Netflix, and it's fucking Kylo Ren and Black Widow. You so know I what I think helps for Netflix? The autoplay. Yes. Of course. Well, that's their that's, that's their the bread thing. and butter, baby. Because Whereas HBO Max is on a play. like, I'm getting something for you. And then it like falls over. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, because <laughs> I'm like, you have like a fucking Marvel actor in a Netflix movie. Yeah. Like, you wanted Sex in the City in Portuguese, right? I got that. for. <laughs> so here's the thing with King yeah. Richard. The poster, it's very hard to tell what it is when you're looking yes. at your TV screen it because is. it's a very small image. Right. Him in the, him and it's him and the, the kids. So it's car. not, inscrutable. it's not Will Smith face no. forward. But, I know but you don't Netflix, even know it's about Netflix Venus and Serena. Netflix has those changing posters yeah. where it's like, David wants the Power of the Dog poster that's just Plemons' face. <laughs> yeah. That selling big to sausage. You, they're selling you like, it's Doctor Strange and Mary Jane in a Western, and this is taken seriously. Yeah. Right? Like, that's all they're saying to you is like, this is a serious movie. And people fucking sampled it. Yeah. And And I, you know, I love that movie, but that was a movie where I'm just like, people who watch that on Netflix and are not in the Tank for Campion are going to be dumbfounded by it. And it seems to be kind of working. Good movie. Okay, so listen, I know Netflix is like a big problem in this industry that we all love and blah, blah, blah. But the, the people who pitched Netflix to the studios and got denied, you know what I mean? Like that moment of like where the the company was doubted somewhat, right? Wasn't that a thing? I mean, the, the classic story uh, is HBO that- HBO could have bought them. You know? Right. Or the some bigger one is that they- Blockbuster could have bought right, them. Right, and they were right, like, right. yeah. I just love the idea thinking. of then running into that person later mm-hmm. and just being like, hey, what's up? Oh, like you were fucking wrong, dude. That just to me feels like some real nice just desserts <laughs> for, for Netflix. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> just just as a dunk in Reed general. Reed Bernie walking around. Reed Hastings. Reed Hastings. Not Although yeah. Reed Bernie will Bernie. probably play him. <laughs> Maybe Reed Bernie really yeah. loves Netflix. Maybe. That he's ran into some yeah. HBO executives. I'm like, just a fiend for sex education. <laughs> I like the two biggest fuckups by HBO. I mean, well, mm-hmm. of, of things they passed on Netflix mm-hmm. and Vinyl. Mad Men. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Netflix and Mad Men. Yeah. Yeah. Vinyl? And yeah. HBO's like, mm, <laughs> nope, feeling good about that one. <laughs> They're like, no, I think we're happy we pass on that. It's like, I, I, I we're forgot to inform Griff, you. We are close to a moment where HBO is like, do we bring back Vinyl? Like, oh. that happens in a meeting yeah. where they're like, okay, because they just announced like, they're rumored to be bringing back Six Feet Under, which right. had one of the most definitive endings yeah. in television yeah. ever. Everybody's death right. was How do they pick. retcon that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And clearly, I mean, they were like, you know what I love is Six Feet. Come on, we can figure out a way to get that back. I we mean, brought back Dexter. Look, let's do the math on this, okay? Vinyl Legacy, right? Or Vinyl colon... Vinyl Afterlife. Uh, vinyl colon, RPM. Yeah, or, right, right, right. or the CD years. Yeah, Vinyl right. Laser. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Vinyl... Final two plastic. <laughs> uh, yep. Cannavale's not coming back. No. Olivia Wilde's not coming back. No, she's busy. She Jim Temple's not coming back. So you're saying no. that they have to shape the story around you. I think I become number four. Yeah, you think cast. it's just sort of like uh, you're like you were secretary of transportation, right. but now you're the vice president. I think if they, Romano is on the edge. I think Max Casella is up back. to maybe number two. Casella is basic, absolute. His agent is like already buying a right. Porsche. Right. All right, yeah. and then let's say they bring in a new character, Adrian Brody. I mean, yeah. Who fits within the universe. Yeah. Yep. Maybe this is the thing, is, is Roman comes in and he's like, um, I got a new pitch. Uh, we buy American Century Records. And Logan's like, American Century? It's a dead record company and from the 70s. Like, hmm. And then I come in as the old man version of my character who had three lines so across you're ten saying episodes. That <laughs> the vinyl revival is a backdoor pilot yes. in succession. Yes. <laughs> and Brian yeah. Cox is yeah. reading this being like, yeah. the fuck is this shit? Do we have, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh-huh. Listen to music, you pig fuck. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Sounds good. I'm yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Know. Bring it back. Why I'm not? just saying that or HBO, can... like 2024, they're like, Vinyl and Tell Me You Love Me, you're coming back. Yeah. Tell Me and You the... Love Me, 
dot, 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 and that more. Sh- that show about the kids selling jeans, that's back. Uh, what what show is How that? How to Make It in America. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. I forgot that, that was what that uh, was. What, what John from Cincinnati. Oh, yeah. I mean, wow. that would that that be That would be number one. Carnival reunion movie. Yeah, Carnival is back. We're going to explain it this time. We promise. <laughs> we promise. <laughs> Please, give us some more episodes. I swear to God, we're going to explain. And then three seasons, they're like, look, I was fucking lying. We ran out of time. I don't know what to tell you. We were about to get to it when you cut us off. Oz is coming back, right? That's got to happen. Yeah. Maybe an Oz prequel. I yeah. don't know. It is funny that just shows uh, never, ever stay dead now unless I was on them. You're right. Then it's <laughs> round. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe That's... they do an animated revival. A vinyl? Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I hope so. And, and, a, and a vinyl. I don't know. And a vinyl. Yeah. And a, and a vinyl Aniacs. Right, I, I can see it. the Animaniacs running a record label. Absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah, there you be, go. You're more of a wacko. Mm, yes. <laughs> I'm a yakko. Oh, because you're tall. Yeah, I'm just more of a yakko. Well, the wacko is the one with, with, the, with the Liverpool accent. He is. That's true. When yeah. I watched that as a kid, I was like, so one of the Beatles plays him. And I was like, my parents were like, no. And I was like, but then why does he talk like That's that? Like, only the Beatles may speak right, this way. Right. I truly thought, like, they have the rights to this. And That's also not Ringo fair. narrated Shining Time Station. You were like, maybe, you know. There, my, my friend, he was a two-inch tall conductor. He appeared on At screen least on camera. Right initially. Do you know what would be cool? So for the Oscars in 2022, mm-hmm. before we got on mic, we were talking about the Oscars. Mm-hmm. And Gr- Griffin and David really want them to take place at a train station yeah, again. Choo choo. Let's let's bring <laughs> in Ringo. Let's bring in Ringo. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's bring like, in Thomas. <laughs> yeah, he's hosting. <laughs> Little Mr. Conductor is hosting. I right. think that would be great. But Thomas brings in the trophies. Yes, every time they're on, they're perched on him. And let's they, not let's not make it Thomas every time. Mate. Percy does one James. or two. Right. <laughs> Edward. <laughs> it's like Miss Golden Globe. You George. Just have a new one. Do they bring How D. many D. of these fuckers can I remember? Toby. I don't know. Deeper, are you up. telling me that you love Thomas the Tank? That is, that is the origin story of, of my train obsession. Of course. My sister, when I was a little the, kid, You have a train me. thing? You don't know that about me? No. Yeah, I was a huge subway nerd. when I, I still am, but I, when I was a little kid, I was a huge subway nerd. And I made my parents like, in like 1990, I'd be like, they'd be like, what do you want to do this weekend, Dave? You want to go to the Children's Museum? You want to go to the Central Park? You know, you want to go experience the magic of New York City and I was like I want to fucking take the J train where does that shit go I want to try to catch us <laughs> yeah and they were like okay should fine. I should take I, him on the J train should I call you the conductor now or the rail man uh, you can call me whatever you want I'm also the spread master yeah. after last <laughs> night's episode you'll see <laughs> oh, oh boy <laughs> you'll see uh, uh, so the final episodes of the year are West Side Story next West Side week. Story mm-hmm. and we're taking a break and then we're going to be dark on Christmas and then we'll be back the start of January with the Matrix Resurrections. Yes. That's what's happening. Yeah. Wow. Which you haven't seen. I haven't seen. Emma and Stefanski, friend of the show, just saw it and told me it was great. I don't know. Do you feel like the way I felt before Toy Story yes. 4 came out? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Sort of like, like where I'm like, it feels wrong that people are seeing it. I'm like, I'm a grown up. I can handle it. But I'm also like, what the fuck? And also just like, this is finished and you're not showing it to Well, me. that's the thing where I'm like, come on, Warner Brothers. And they're like, huh? What? Right. You like, oh, okay. I don't care that you like the sequels. Who can, right. no one cares. The about idea that. that's on a hard drive feels like unfair. Did you guys see that picture of Keanu driving like his Ferrari with a Christmas tree on I top it's of a it? Porsche. Porsche. Yes. Yeah. I mean, just great, great Keanu photo. Santa Claus. Santa, yeah. Santa Neo. Can I end this episode by sharing a very quick Keanu story? I sure. Heard that's just okay. an incredible so what a guy story. Well, the only kind of Keanu story there is. Uh, Keanu, uh, I, I, I know someone who was friends with Keanu. Okay. Humble brag. Uh, yes. Uh, Keanu was in New York City, the, uh, part of the group going out to restaurants, right? Um, they go to like four restaurants trying to get a table and get turned away. Just walking to establishments. Mm-hmm. Keanu's not the proactive one. He's standing in the group. Someone goes, hey, do you have a table for six? No, sorry. No, sorry. They go to like four restaurants. And then the fifth restaurant they go to, uh, they go, excuse me, do you have a table for five? No, sorry. Who's there sitting at the bar of the restaurant? Parker Posey. She turns around. Keanu, oh my God, so nice to see you. And then the matri is like, oh, oh, excuse me. We did, we did in fact find a table. Keanu Reeves is so unassuming in life, mm. so unwilling. And he's not going to press the issue. He's not going to be like. Absolutely. Uh, you know. 
And it oh, wasn't even like, I don't want to make a scene. Right. He yeah, just yeah, took yeah. it face value. I guess they don't have a table. They right. told us he, they don't have a table. In 2021, it's still going to be like, oh, sorry. Yeah, they're booked up. Okay. Well, we should have planned ahead. Yeah, it's, my, it's actually on me. Let's go right. to Pizza It took Hut. another famous person who clearly was like, Parker Posey for two. Right. To go like Keanu and have the guy look around and be like, that's Keanu. That guy is let's, not walking into this restaurant. Let's with not you. say that maybe Parker Posey got on, got on Resi and made a Resi. Okay. We don't know. I mean, she sure could have. Parker, Parker Posey, a fiend on open table. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know in movies she plays the kind of pushy person who might just get herself sure. a table at the door. But sure. you know. I'm now questioning in my head, is it Parker Posey or Juliette Lewis in the story? But either way. Sure. Right. They both seem plausible. Keanu I Pals. think it was Parker Posey. Okay. Uh, Great Marie, story. Thank you for being on the episode. Thanks for Thanks, having Marie. me. I gotta pee. You guys take it out. Okay. Bye, David. Yep. We should follow him into the bathroom. <laughs> ben, you have that 3D mic, right? Can we place it in the bathroom and get sort of like spatial audio? Yeah, of course. Oh, I already David. did. Okay, great. Perfect. So don't worry. That's been sort of like <laughs> a overlay. track that I've laid underneath yes. this whole episode. So yeah, now you should be hearing David. Pee. Absolutely. This episode that has to drop in 12 hours. Yep. Yeah. No problem. Just no problem. All together, real quick. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media and so much more. You've been such a big help over the last year on this podcast. Oh, thanks, um, Griffin. AJ McKee and Alex Barron for our editing. Nick Lariano and JJ Birch for our research. Even though they, uh, we we give them a break end of the year on these new releases. Um, they're knee deep in Campion they're working on the Campion dossier and they've pulled up some amazing shit so far and uh, we've already started recording these episodes they're a lot of fun it's fun to do um, thank you to Leigh Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song you can listen to their new album Extremely Loud Incredibly Online wherever albums are listened to thank you to Pat Reynolds and Joe Bowen for our artwork go to blankystabrat.com for some real nerdy shit go to our Shopify page for some real nerdy merch including some new end of year specials that you will hear about in our talking the walk 2021 episode uh tune in next week for as we said a uh, west side story a musical directed by steven spielberg Oof. first spielberg movie in like four years i think yeah since we, ready we had, player one we had a lot of them in a run Right. He's one of the guys we've been able to revisit the most. Because he did the post that same year. He did the year. post. He did Ready Player One. He did another one. <laughs> I'm forgetting. Um, but yes, I'm very... BFG. We ended on BFG. I think BFG had come out when we did our miniseries. Bill Burr? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, three movies, right? It's post Ready Player One. Or is it just two? This is the third. Maybe. I feel this might be the third. Went back to the wall one more time, but whatever. No, I, I think that's it because he's been, it's been three years. His last movie was, was the fun. excellent film Ready, Ready Player One. Ready Player One honks. Fucking I rules. I've rewatched it, watched it yeah. like four times. I it's so good. I hate, Griff, David's been making this argument for months and I'm like, I'm going to have to fucking Griff, rewatch I, this it's thing. It's good. Griff, I bought this deal on eBay for too much money because it's mm. not like available anymore. I've had a couple of those mistakes recently. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. Well, and then we've got another Spielberg coming up next year, probably. Fablemans. 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 I truly like, and you know, West Side Story is dedicated to his dad who died while he was making it. Like, mm -hmm. and it really is wild. They're like, his dad dies and he immediately announces like, I will be making a film that is a uh, but a young boy whose parents get divorced in Arizona, yeah. you know, like where you're like, oh, you're making the dad movie like right now. And I'm writing a script for the first time in 20. Right. Yeah. And like, and then it's, it's just, it's just very interesting. I can't wait. That's can't the only thing on the spreadsheet. We looked at, we got like six new releases from past filmmakers on the books for next year. Yeah. As of now, 2022 in general is incredibly loaded year as much yeah. as people are sort of bemoaning cinema or whatever. Like it's kind of wild. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Hey, big year for Blank Check, too. Some cool guests we've already confirmed. Yes. Yep. That's Some fucking true. cool for shit. For Champion and Beyond. Ooh, ah. <laughs> Enough. I don't know. Episode's um, over. Yeah. Well, uh, just I need one miracle. So if you want to pray to Michael <laughs> McGivney, just trying to get myself to the Vatican VIP style. I'm going to hype this up on social media Please so do. much. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get a hashtag. We're going to start a campaign. Ben needs a miracle. Ben needs a miracle. All he needs is a miracle. All he needs is you. Uh, and as always, David genuinely seems stressed out about the fact that he hasn't seen Matrix yet. He is looking at his computer screen with intensity <laughs> that I rarely see. 
even though I don't think he's texting about the Matrix right now, maybe I'm wrong, it just feels like it has seeped into every fiber of his being. Okay. okay. I want a good, clean podcast. <laughs> okay? No this? funny stuff. Who's this guy? All right? No swearing? No, well, you can swear. No but don't get, a, don't get carried away. No Fuck! Stuff? Can I take the Lord's name in vain? How yeah, Catholic are we getting with this? Jeez. Well, I mean, <laughs> we'll determine that. Can I, can I blast? What, what's the word? Blas- can you blaspheme? blaspheme? Can you blaspheme. blaspheme us off? Yeah. Anyway, um, do the quote. Okay. We don't have to start this way. No, but you're yeah. going to put it at the end. Oh, yeah. sure. Cool. A little bonus. Not to give you editing work. <sighs> we don't have to put it at the end. It can be the start. Well, maybe you got to put it at the end. Okay. Ready? 